race is about people versus money. We've got people, they've got money. It's time we acknowledge that not all Democrats are the same. That a Democrat who takes corporate money, profits off foreclosure, doesn't live here, doesn't send his kids to our schools, doesn't drink our water or breathe our air, cannot possibly represent us. Everybody, it is Friday, June eighth, twenty eighteen. Welcome to Raging Chickens Out to Coop podcast. We have got a new mixer up, and uh, it looks like our sound quality should now increase. I uh, love to hear your feedback. Um, if it, that's coming through for you too as well, that'd be great. Uh, I am Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our Capitol muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. On today's show, Trump talks about pardoning himself. Sounds a little seedy. Giuliani and Christie said self-pardoning. Oh, God, I just can't get that image out of my mind. Is unthinkable. Trump says, I have the absolute right to pardon myself anytime and anywhere I want. U.S. Ambassador to Germany says that he's interested in helping bolster the far right in Europe. Welcome coming fascism. Giuliani tells the Wall Street Journal that Kim Jong-un got on his hands and knees and begged American diplomats uh, diplomats to come to the June 12th summit in Singapore, as originally planned. I think that's going to work out well for all of us in the future of the planet. Trump disinvites the Philadelphia Eagles after no one from the team was going to show, show up for the White House-like fest. So Trump decides instead to... Um, Sing God Bless America like pretending knew the words. <laughs> no cake for you. Supreme Court rules that a religious baker had the right to not bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. This is interesting how people are spinning this. And according to a recent report from Zillow Research, the next recession is expected by 2020. Yep, and because we have a freak show in the White House and in D.C., we're not paying attention to stuff like that. Jahan Wilcox, a spokesperson for EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, calls a journalist a piece of trash when asked for a comment about recent resignations. Yeah, <laughs> because that makes sense. And a conservative Stanford professor asks his students, one who is a research assistant, to do oppo research on a progressive undergraduate student to get the dirt, he said in emails. And it was an awesome piece, great piece in a Columbian Journalism Review this week on class and funding journalism that we'll talk a little bit about. Bron Bronx activist and Bernie campaigner, actually, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who you heard in the opening intro today, is taking on a Democratic machine in the Bronx and Queens in her challenge of the fourth most powerful Democrat in the House, Joseph Crowley. And Dave Koch steps down for Koch's Industries and the Koch political machine. He's sick, but no worries. There's another brother, actually the main one, who's been running the stuff into the ground. Us into the ground, I should say. Recent UN report says Donald Trump's administration is forcing millions of Americans into financial ruin and poverty. That's great. Today's segment two, Pennsylvania Focus, Scott Wagner resigns from the Senate so that he could focus on the governor. Scott Wagner's first political stunt since leaving office involves going into a poor minority community of Philadelphia to browbeat the city because the grass of the local park, Malcolm X Park, mind you, wasn't mowed. Scott Wagner compared to Penguin from the Batman. Is that a bridge too far? Is it immature? Have we really lost our sense of decorum? Batman. Tell us, Batman. <laughs> the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette is actually killing political cartoons from a longtime cartoonist that are critical of Trump. That doesn't bode well. But a PA judge rejects attempts by the Catholic Church to delay publishing a grand jury report about sex abuse by priests and cover-ups by religious leaders. The grand jury report focused on six of the eight Catholic dioceses, Allentown, Scranton, Harrisburg, Erie, Greensburg, and Pittsburgh. Of course, we've already had the uh, laying bare of what's happened in Philadelphia. 
where over a hundred priests were charged, or at least found guilty of horrible things. Philly DSA members joined pe Poor People's Campaign to rally for a healthy environment and health care for all. Philadelphia Bernie Kratz wins South Philly ward seats that were once controlled by Johnny Doc and his machine. Q getting people getting pissed off at us in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that sounds like. It's your break lines, not there mine. There you go. That's yeah, right. Exactly. All right. And I want to announce this is a huge deal. The launch of Free Range. Free Range is going to be a collaborative pe collaborative podcast between me from Raging Chicken Press and Colleen Fitzgerald from A Home Stony Run. And we're going to talk about food, food policy, building sustainable communities and kind of communities of resistance. Um, it's going to be a, a, a hoot. Um, first episode will launch June 13th. I think, right? Whatever Wednesday, next Wednesday is. Air Force Space Command hands over responsibility for fighting hackers in cyberspace to the Air Combat Command. Space Force. NASA's new climate-denying administrator Jim Bridenstine says it's time to bring the privateers to the International Space Station and space exploration. Well, a little clarification came on later. The guy who runs the ISS basically said, well, it's not actually for sale. Think of it more like a mall. <laughs> really. NASA, that irrelevant um, kind of Earth-focused science organization, reveals that Antarctica's largest iceberg is about to melt away near South America, but we don't really need to know that. Good thing that Free Will has got some awesome stuff, came out, or has some awesome stuff that's already come out this week, and they hit the canning hard, right? They've got a, a bunch of new releases that we're going to talk to you about today in today's last call. Um, just some great stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to heading over there later on this afternoon to uh, pick up some of the new offerings. And I want to say, if you've got some beer tips that you think should, you, we should give a shout out to, send us an email to ragingchickenpress at gmail.com with the subject line, last call tips. Um, I'd love to hear what's happening around the state, particularly local breweries, local regional breweries um, that you think uh, you know could benefit from a little shout out here in the podcast. It'd be awesome. Why don't you tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org. You can also tune in on Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you missed the show, just go to ricksmithshow.com and click on the Free Speech TV icon. Or better yet, go to freespeech.org and click on the Rick Smith, show, look, Rick Smith Show in the archives. That was kind of redundant. Sorry about that, folks. I want to give a huge shout out to our new member, right? Yes, another new member this week. Thanks to our newest member, Connor. Connor jumped in at the $10 a month level. Woo! Thank you, Connor. And this is kind of like, look, I want to put this back at everybody's, um, you know, uh, uh, um, attention, right? So we are basically at, um, we've hit the $247 a month right now on our Patreon site. We need to get to $350 a month to hit our next goal. And that will boost payments, right, to our writers from 50 bucks a month uh, as a base payment, 50 bucks to 75 bucks a month. We already hit our first goal, as many of you already know, um, where we've been able to kind of increase payment for additional articles and things like this. That's awesome. But the only way that we can create this kind of sustainable, progressive, pull no punches um, journalism is with your support by you becoming a member. So please do that. Support Raging Chicken Press. You can help support Raging Chicken Press for a little five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash RC Press and choose your membership level. If you're not ready to become a member, no problem. Just go to ragingchickenpress.org and click on the big blue donate button in the right sidebar. Right? Just click donate and you can donate any amount you want from like two bucks up to 3,000. How's that? <laughs> Please do. But with the midterm, 2018 midterm elections right around the corner, we need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media on the movement. The best way to do that is become a member of Raging Chicken by going to patreon.com slash RC Press. Woo! Well, Sean, man, big week, big week. Always is. Always is, right? I think that's pretty much uh, the lesson for... Uh, for our lives these days, uh, it's almost kind of uh, boring to say it, <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you. I was going to say, I, I love the, uh, the the intro clip uh, from uh, the the, the uh, DSA member and her video, um, her campaign video that, that The Intercept published this week. Yeah, it's pretty uh -oh. amazing. It's pretty amazing. You know, I do. Um, um, I, I think that 
to start. Be, yeah, she's she's just amazing. We definitely got to talk about her campaign. I mean, you said you've seen her her campaign video and stuff like this, right? Yeah, I saw it a couple of times already. Yeah, I mean, it just it's absolutely fantastic. And I I, I wanted to highlight her race um, here because if you want to talk about messaging, right? If you want to, and again. You know, it's not simply like messaging, like crafted by a bunch of consultants. I mean, this is kind of like organic community grown messaging. messaging going after the old white club uh, that's been controlling everything really in these districts where that that they're that they're not representative representative of. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And and she just nails her um, apart from being this old, rich white guy who doesn't participate with inside the community. Oh, absolutely. We're not not within our community, not within our schools and stuff like that. No, absolutely. And, and, and that's the messaging that, um, you know, like the DSA is bringing forward, um, going after people, you know, like here in Pennsylvania with Dom and Paul Costa, um, you know, or, you know, down in South Philly or down in like, you know, just where we have it, it's, uh, I guess, the generational rift within the Democratic Party. Well, you know, it's good. You know, this is it's it's funny. Like, you know, in my in uh, in my first year writing classes, like my composition classes, um, we do this this unit on um, on kind of millennials and things like this. And actually, which is kind of irrelevant now because there is no there are millennials. Actually, technically, the the, the new generation coming in will be like you know the. the generation after millennials but whatever but you know and the focus on that and what's always you know part of part of what we do in there is we kind of show all the you know the criticisms that are come from boomers and people in my generation right and kind of gen x and stuff like this and looking down and basically saying millennials you know here's all the criticism about the millennials but when you look at the actual practice of what millennials are doing and pew research has been fantastic about tracking this is that millennials are actually kind of much more engaged um, than people of my generation, right? It's just in, in, engaged in ways that are different um, than than show up in traditional measures. And one of the key things was is that they're kind of distrustful of institutions, right? Of established institutions. What we saw in 2016, right? And now, um, and now through the Trump administration, is that now people now that generation, your generation, right, are finally in a position where say, yep our distrust has now got a voice, right? And all the things that reflect our experiences, right? Our student loan debt, or the fact that the economy is absolutely crap, right? Yeah, there's an increase in job, but all those jobs are kind of like minimum wage jobs or less. Yeah, you don't support healthcare or living wages for all. Okay, boom, you're off. off exactly, like, exactly. It's... And I think that, you know, and what the good thing is, is that the way I look at it, like, you know, I can't tell you how awesome it feels um, to, to finally see that, right? Because, you know, um, it's just kind of, you know, as long as you're waiting for, it, you kind of keep doing this work, you keep doing this work. And now it's like mo millennials are doing is not, and this is what I like about what's, what's happening in that organization, like in the organizing is that millennials aren't just doing it simply as like generation warfare, like against the, against the, like their, like, you know, their parents and the generation before, like we saw so often with the boomers, but it's also basically leading the charge and bringing other people with them. Right. So, I mean, that's what's been in incredible to me is that and and kudos to those folks who have been doing this work for a long time. Right. Who are are stepping back. Right. And bringing what you have got to the table, bringing your work, bringing your expertise, bringing your background to the table, but stepping back and allowing kind of like these young folks. Right. They're emerging. Right. To take the lead. Right. Because that's what we need in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, and it's nice seeing it um, happen and. Um, no, that's definitely the future of democratic politics within this country. And we're, we're looking at the point where, what, five or 10 years? I mean, you know, overlooking all this, um, you know, we need to have a hard swing to the left. Yep. And I don't see the fight between um, the Tea Party, or I, I, I don't think the comparisons are there to say that the DSA is the Tea Party of the left. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> really, like, I don't see that comparison because we're not a lot. I don't know. I, I just see it as being a bad comparison, right? I think it's like the media trying to look for a narrative, right? I, I think it's a way that we can operate with outside of democratic politics, but also, um, you know, it's a way of changing democratic politics from within. Yep. And it's also making mainstream ideas that are extremely popular, like healthcare for all, making sure healthcare is a student, right? Taking care of student uh, debt and making sure, free public higher education is available for everyone. These are ideas that people want. Right. 
Well, and here's here's the thing I would say I would say about the Tea Party comparison is a uh, Dave Weigel had a um, really interesting coverage of the California primaries, and uh, he was just on the Majority Report Wednesday, and um, I, he said something about the, about that Tea Party comparison, and I agree with you when people kind of make make it as a lazy comparison. Like, in other words, uh, these are just like the extremists on the left, right? That doesn't, that not at all. But what Weigel said that was, was interesting for me, because he covered the Tea Party really closely, like not just from afar, but was on the ground, kind of, you know, went to meetings and things like this to actually see what was happening. In other words, he did what a, what a real reporter should do, right? And when he was out there in California, what he said, he, um, he said that, you know, what reminds him about the Tea Party stuff and why he's thinks there's there's some usefulness in that comparison, not in terms of ideological stuff, but in terms of energy. Right. He said when he was showing up right um, to these meetings right all over California um, to kind of see what was going on, they were just packed. Right. They were packed by people that had not been involved and not been activated before. Um, and then they, they had an energy um, that did not exist ever before. And the, the second piece was is that instead of it just being like like arguing from the outside, looking to actively and strategically kind of carve out a space within a Democratic Party, which is what I love about um, um, uh, what Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez said, right? Basically about, you know, it's time to recognize that not all Democrats are the same, right? So instead of the narrative that we saw in 2016 about, you know, Bernie's not a Democrat, right? We're not, you know, whatever. Um, Bernie's not still a Democrat. Still people are still arguing about that. He became an independent afterwards. And I'm like, yeah, and guess what? I was like, who, it's like, I, I love this because I respond with, um, when was the last time you saw Hillary Clinton stumped for someone in 2018? Never. There you go. <laughs> like, there you go. No, I mean, like, but no, seriously, uh, like Bernie's been the most popular politician. Uh, he's been calling up politicians, asking to stump for them in pen- battleground states like Pennsylvania. Like, I mean, like the thing about Pennsylvania is where we're at right now. We'll talk about this later is how important we are um, to the rest of the country. Right. <clears throat> in relationship right. with flipping the house and stuff like this. And I mean, yes, a lot of like, you know, um, a lot of like more establishment like candidates got through their primaries and everything. But the stuff that's happening in the state houses, uh, within local wards and local on the committee level and stuff like that. I mean, the party is slowly transferring into a left leaning party and the machines are being broken. Yeah. And that's uh, and, and that, that's incredible. And I think that, you know, it shows what what um, what um, Ocasio to, or Cortez's campaign shows and the language and why I wanted to kind of bring that in the intro and talk about her today is that idea that, look, it's not all or nothing. Right. The fact that it's time to recognize that there's different factions. We deserve here. a voting block within the Democratic Party and we deserve a say. Exactly. Right. And so this is a space in which we have to say it and then we're going to kind of carve that out. And now instead of being afraid of articulating it, we're going to actually run on these things. Right. Um, so, I mean, absolutely important. I mean, yeah. Also, uh, another thing, you had a DSA candidate uh, activist taking on um, who announces candidacy to take on the Pittsburgh uh, city council leader. And you know what she said? No. They're socialists. What's DSA? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no. People are actually calling themselves socialist in public. <laughs> yeah, right. So they're sitting there. Did they put the garlic around their necks and help like hold up like pencils and crosses and stuff like that? Is that what they did? Yeah, exactly. Some fucking like Salem's lot kind of bad scene. Something like this. But um, you know, I, I do I, I do I, I feel almost bad because we started out, you know, this wasn't the way I was thinking about starting off I starting off today's podcast. I wanted to start off today's podcast with a little bit more seriousness, right? Because, you know, I think we should we should no look, I mean, I think we should give some respect to uh you know our flag and country sean um so um <laughs> did you see the photos of people taking a knee well well let's be, oh, look, before house. look before you start getting into your kind of lefty kind of like criticism of all kind of things american um i thought it was really important that um some of the audio um you know t- trump took a lot of criticism for you know um kind of sit, telling the eagles that they can't come and holding his own kind of like god bless america we love america and the flag kind of rally um, but I thought it was really touching because some of the audio um, of, of, of Trump, um, some of the, you know, his mic, I guess, um, got leaked this week um, when they were <laughs> singing um, God Bless America. So I just thought, I just want to play that. So I think we should all kind of have a little respect um, for our president and just listen to his his amazing singing of uh, God Bless America. So here it is, folks. Okay. Uh, 
Let's make a barricade. Da, 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 love me and her. <laughs> no worries. Let's <laughs> America. Bad hombre, stay home. There you go, man. <laughs> this can't be. This can't be real. It's the best traditions of America. Look, improvisation. He's got a little jazz action going on in there. He doesn't take over the stage. He lets other people do most of the singing. Kind of adds in his own kind of little spice to it and stuff. <laughs> Oh my god! No, that was actually brought to us by BadLipReading.com. Okay. <laughs> I saw the video online. Yeah, and no, but I wouldn't be surprised like if he didn't know like the fucking words. No, he didn't. I mean, if you look at him, I mean, you, yeah. that's why. If you if like, uh, I'll put you know this is this will be linked up in the in the show notes about uh, this this piece from BadLipReading.com. I like I was like nearly fell over when I saw it because. Uh, <laughs> I just you, saw the video. <laughs> yeah, you watch the video, and like he's he doesn't know the words. Right. He's uh, you know, he doesn't know the words that God bless America. Right. This was his idea. Right. His thing to do this stuff, to put himself up front with the kind of military behind him and God bless America. And he sat there and he didn't even freaking know the words. Of God bless America. I mean, it was like it was unbelievable. So uh, kudos to bad lip dot com for that one. Um, I'm the link is going to go to the video because it's even better when you've got the um, you see it paired up with the video because it just it just I hilarious. actually thought this is something like you did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it, but you know, I was thinking, it's like, oh man, it would be great if you like bad lip reading. And then I saw a tweet by them with, a, with I'm like, all right, well, they you know did the work for me, so it's good. Uh, but in so, so yeah, craziness. So let's talk a little about the Eagles, then we'll talk about the pardoning stuff before we go on. So uh, yeah, so here you go. We start the disinvites to the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, Super Bowl champions, um, historic moment uh, for the city of Philadelphia and all Eagles fans across the country. And Trump gives him the big kind of like high handed f you. Yeah, and it was because no one from the Eagles was really going to go down and go see him. <laughs> Which I mean, like um, this is like one of the things that uh, they've been saying for a while. These players and um. I wouldn't want to go to someone's house party if the, the host, you know, is a molester, or is someone who gropes women. Yep. I'm like, you know, I can't tell my kids that, but like, I, as, as a human being, as a man, I did that. And on top of all the protests and everything with uh, the NFL, um, you know, there were some actions taken by the Eagles this year. They raised their fists, some of them. No, no one took a knee. Um, but this is more than him uh, picking a fight with the NFL and continuing. This is him. Um, using like the worst in racial dog whistle politics, right? In order to cement power, right? Uh, with people who are flat out racist, with people who are running like Lou Barletta, uh, people like uh, Mike Regan who actively did not watch the NFL this year because of the stuff that was going on, the people who have been hoodwinked into believing that this is about unpatriot unpatriotic, uh, and just completely skip over the fact that this is all about um, this is police brutality. Is the main issue here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Van Jones had a really good thing this week uh, clip where he said, "I am a ninth generation American. I am the first one in my family's history to ever be born with all the rights granted to me." Not crazy, man. I mean, this is like what it's really about, and this is what uh, the protests were at the NFL about racial equality. But I mean, really, the more dangerous thing, more overarching thing, is he is using this as a way to. Uh, as a way to just feed propaganda to people uh, who are willing to accept unmitigated, uh, like the unsubstantiated bullshit that he spews from his mouth. Right. And that's, that's the scary thing. Um, when I was home uh, for the Labor Day weekend, you know, I did watch the History Channel's uh, Rise of the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. They had like a three-part series, black and white, and it showed footage and, you know, letters from people leaving Germany and who were, you know, scared of what the, this is going back in the 20s and 30s, this is before World War II breaking out. And before the, um, you know, concentration camps and everything. And people saw where this was going. Right. And really, this is what we're using the same. This is like the same sort of tactics that we're using going after uh, immigrants and people of color uh, in order to, you know, rile up the, the racists and the very worst in this country. 
Yeah, I agree. You know, and, you know, we talked about this quite a bit um, before the show today. And, you know, I, I do think this is, you know, there's it's just really, really troubling um, the directions things are going. And like, again, you know, if I and like this is the type of stuff that should scare people. Because yeah. this, this is what fascists and this is what strong men and this is what authoritarians do. Right. You know, I, I think that, you know, from from reading science fiction my whole life, right, um, it, it kind of, you know, and also just, I, you know, uh, the way I think about it, it's funny because it, reading science fiction in my mind is and thinking about things in kind of science fiction terms and also kind of what I do in terms of teaching kind of say argumentation and studying argument and all this kind of stuff. Um, it, there's similar processes that I kind of always think about is like, OK, you take. You, you you basically say if you're you're having an argument like you're you're in an argument you see somebody making an argument and they make th- this particular claim one of the things that I've always done myself and also do in my classroom now is to say okay you're making this claim what if you extend that claim forward what does that say about the the vision of how we how the world is and should be right if you argue x what does that mean about how you think about relationships between people Right. What do you think about the way that kind of our government should work? What do you think about, you know, what values are and what values that says and how people should operate? Right. And it's the idea is that, you know, our the actions that we take at a small level, right, have like project out kind of these these parts about how we're seeing the world or operating in the world. And I think that same when you're watching kind of looking at events. Right. And so with science fiction, it's kind of like you're taking dynamics that are going on, right? And then you're projecting it off into a future so in a part so you can better see it, right? So you can see it. So what would happen if we extended the logic of this out, right? And that's why, you know, the best science fiction is not just completely fanciful, right? Um, But it's actually grappling with a dynamic that is present, but it's projected into the future. And I think, you know, so I look at these developments, um, you know, kind of what we were talking about in the show today, or before the show today, and it is exactly troubling. Um, And, you know, I I know, I know the impulse to say, look, that's not going to happen. That's kind of crazy. That's like you're projecting it too much out. But, you know, not so much is that, you know, the choices that have that that we need to make now, right, will determine whether or not these dynamics that we see in place now um, and things like, for example, Trump openly talking about pardoning himself, right, being one with the law, right? The U.S. ambassador to Germany going over and basically saying, yes, we're going out there to kind of help support right wing movements, right? Right before he meets with Angela, um, uh, Angela Merkel, right? Um, right when we see that, you know, him making alliances on uh, the Trump administration, making alliance with kind of um, dictators like right, in China and North Korea and even South Korea with some autocratic um, tendencies there, we got to pay attention to that. Right. Um, And not just about the persona of Trump, um, but the direction that we're heading to as a culture. And that, you know, that that's that's scary stuff, Sean. Yeah. I mean, he is uh, supporting people, uh, propping up people who want far right governments and ideologies that were stamped out after the conclusion of World War Two. I mean, that were stamped out of, you know, like those areas, I mean, through through war, but also. I mean, <clears throat> like they want to bring those ideologies back to the forefront of Western Europe, of Eastern Europe. Like right. it's, I mean, like uh, some of these countries, like one of the things also, like I thought a lot of these countries, um, once World War II broke out, that they kind of like fought. But no, a lot of countries rolled over and That's right. a lot of the fascists in those countries were happy that they showed up. Like now it's time to go after the commies. Now it's time to go after you know the people we don't agree with, and we have the backing of this you know fascist force. Right, and that was the whole thing, right? I mean, there used to be a time I remember learning when I was in school, right, about why you don't uh, appease fascism, <laughs> right? It's the same principle. You don't appease it because it, it's insatiable in its appetite, right? When you appease, it's just like you know. With I mean, you take it down to the playground, right? Is that you don't constantly appease the bully. Right. The only thing that stops the bully is getting the bully getting smacked down. Right. Or people standing up collectively against the bully. Right. I mean, that's it. 
Um, you don't kind of say, well, OK, look, this time is going to pass and the elections are coming. No, you, you got to do it now. I mean, thank God that's what that, that's what's going on. But, you know, here's here's a perfect example. And um, the in the Atlantic this week, um, Thomas Wright had this piece called uh, Trump is choosing Eastern Europe. Um and there was, I don't know if people saw this or not, but basically, here, here's, I'll give you the, this is the kind of opening from in the Atlantic article. So over the past week, the recently appointed U.S. ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell, has been in the news for all the wrong re- reasons. On June 3rd, Breitbart published an interview with Grinnell in which he said, quote, there are a lot of conservatives throughout Europe who have contacted me to say they are feeling there is a resurgence going on. I absolutely want to empower other conservatives throughout Europe, other leaders. I think there is a groundswell of conservative policies that are taking hold because of the failed policies of the left. Right? Now, he said this, and he gave this interview, and he was saying this right before he was going to meet with Angela Merkel. And you think about this, right? What that means is basically saying to in the country that experienced right the rise of far right politics, the gradual groundswell that led to like you know a, a culture of annihilation in the Nazis, right? I mean that was what it was, um, and this is I can only imagine what she's got to you know see. I'm like oh my god, they're doing it again, <laughs> except this time with the help of the United States of America. I mean, that's 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 pretty freaking crazy. So, you know, um, you look at what happened is it's like, also par for the course. I mean, we we have a history of supporting fascists and autocrats in, you yep. know, pretty much every section of the world for the past 50 years as well. You look at what we did in the Middle East and overthrowing the Shah or you look at where we've, our South America policy over the past 50 years, 60 years, you know, since the Dulles brothers has been to overthrow socialist uh, governments or governments with socialist leanings and replace them for dictators who will free the markets. Right. And, you know, and for those folks who want to see this as simply just just about Donald Trump. Right. And not as a, a kind of a movement. Right. That is happening that we need to put an end to. Let me give you an example of this. Right. So, yes, we got this ambassador. Is this just kind of, you know, and so much of the it just drives me crazy. So much of the kind of cable news, especially focuses on, you know, the sparkly stuff. Right. That I can't believe this guy said this. Blah, it's going to be this this random. Is it because he's inexperienced? Is it because it's like the same garbage over and over again. What, what this Atlantic article does, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but, you know, it focuses in on this one. So I'm to say, no, 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 look, there's actually something happening here that we've got to stop. So in addition to those comments, here's here's this example. So we talked There's this guy's name is Wes Mitchell. Right. Wes Mitchell Mitchell is the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Right. And in a recent speech that he gave, well, actually recent, like Tuesday, he gave a speech at the Heritage Foundation, right, um, laying out um, the Europe strategy. Right. So listen to this. And again, this is from The Atlantic. Quote, Mitchell, a well-regarded expert on Central and Eastern Europe, is the author of three books on foreign policy, including a forthcoming history of the Habsburg Empire. The main message of his thoughtful, well-written and strategic speech The United States views Europe through the lens of a strategic competition between Western civilization and Russia and Chinese alternative. Mitchell effectively announced a pivot in America's Europe policy away from Western Europe and toward the East, his natural stomping ground, and the South. In fact, Mitchell criticized Western Europe for failing to take strategic competition seriously, particularly on defense spending and confronting Iran. Right. So there's kind of more of it there. But, you know, again, shifting away from Western Europe, who was grounded in social democracies, has been part of a tradition of kind of, say, liberal democracies. Right. And left leaning stuff toward what we see some emergent and what's unsaid in Mitchell's speech is that a lot of the folks that are looking to build alliances with are these kind of emergent autocratic regimes. Right. Like we saw in Melania Trump's home country this past week. Poland. Right. You know, exactly. Yeah. And I so, mean, and also the president has, uh, you know, favors favors people like Dirt Day down the Philippines and, you know, autocrats who, oh, let's just kill anyone who can caught with drugs. Right. That'll solve the problem. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, you know, let's go for a helicopter ride. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me. I'm going to give you the union tour. <laughs> right? I'm going to go down to Colombia and give you the union tour, <laughs> right? Which means throwing you out the plane. So um, crazy. So I mean, again, that's nuts. I mean, and this whole idea 
um, you know, Sarah Kenzior was on the Rick Smith show this past week again, and I tweeted out. So again, this is like you know, this Sarah Kenzior. Um, anytime she's on the Rick Smith show, anytime she's anywhere, um, it, it should be uh, required watching and listening um, because she's. This is what she studied. I mean, she studied autocratic and dictatorial regimes, and she's broken it down in terms of how they emerge and things like this. And she's been going nuts, being like, "This is this is exactly it." And one of the things that she said when she talked about when you know you have Giuliani and Christie coming out this week saying, you know, t- this whole talk about Trump self pardoning, which still sounds pornographic to me, but self-pardoning is unthinkable because if he did that, he pardoned himself, then the Congress would step forward and would impeach him. So it's politically untenable. And I'm like, no. what, what, what world? What the hell has this Congress done done to resist him? Right? Because I mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure this Congress, if he was to say these elections are invalid, after the shellacking they're going to get in November. Yep. Like, I mean, that's the type of stuff I worry about. Okay. Now we're going to have someone. Nope. Sorry. These we're not going to we're not going to obey these 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 elections. Yep. Imagine the crisis that that that, that would cause. Yeah. Especially when you've got like, you know, exactly. And especially when you've got the leadership of the Democratic Party. Right. Um, it, Like in the Senate is Chuck Schumer. Right. I mean, you've got you got Chuck Schumer is is, you know, no, no. If, like, if he, has, they, he, he has to go look for an Exxon gas station to sit out in front of. And, yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> you know, I just I just want to I just want to get along, guys. You know, it's like. He's not going to push the envelope on it. I mean, he's he's already shown that, you know, the Chuck and Nancy, Chuck and Nancy, you remember that from way back. He's looking to make deals and work with Trump on things and wanted to get back to reasonable politics with uh, like unreasonable people. It's like sitting down with fascists and expecting the fascists to have a change of heart. Right. This is like 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 bare knuckle politics at this point. Right. It's not about changing of heart. It's about policy and power. Um, and we cannot allow this to move any further. So. I don't know. Crazy, man. It's crazy. So we'll see. Um, Because right after that, you know, Giuliani and Christie say, you know, about self pardoning is unthinkable. Trump comes out almost immediately after and CNBC basically says, nope, I have the absolute right to pardon myself. Right. He goes and tweets this stuff out. And what Sarah Kenzior was basically saying is like, this is Trump preparing the ground to make it seem normal. That people will he'll be, uh, have enough of this back and forth about whether or not it's pardoned. Forget whether it's actually legal, you know, legal or not. He's trying to normalize it, and she says this is the pattern of how this kind of autocratic. And he's trying happens. to issue a pardon today to Muhammad Ali. What? Yeah, before before we started, like he tried oh, to issue God. a pardon. I mean, yeah, we're just pardoning people left and right, and it's probably just this game of like. Yeah, just just to pardon people. Well, that's exactly what Ken- Sarah Kenzura says. They're like, look, look, I can do anything I want. Watch this. Pardon this person. I'm going to pardon this person. Right? Yep, that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so, and at least like people from uh, Ali's family came out and said, no, we don't accept this pardon. Uh, there's no need for it, given that the Supreme Court of the United States overturned it in 1971. Yep. There you go. He's like... All it takes is like you just come to the White House like Anna Kasparian did. Like Anna Kasparian came to the White House, talked to me, told me about this poor woman who's in jail. And I said, pardon. Kim Kardashian. I'm sorry. Kim Kardashian. What did I say? <laughs> Anna Kasparian. No, no. Sorry. Anna Kasparian. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> Kim Kardashian. I meant Anna Kasparian is what uh, goes over at the. Um, uh, the Young Turks. I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, I was. Th- well, whatever. Okay. Well, but yeah, that was that was nuts. So anyway, so. Pay attention, folks. I'm going to go out on there. Um, in other news, we also have got the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, the no cake for you decision, right, in which uh, basically the court found, um, and this was interesting. I had this long back and forth with people on this because um, um, once the ruling came out, I, I kind of posted this to Facebook and said, look, elections have consequences, election have consequences, election have consequences, right? And everyone got on me saying, like, yeah, but this was a 7-2 decision. So, see, this is not really – wouldn't have made a difference one way or another. I'm like, oh, God, it's not my point. My point is, is like, you know, and I had to kind of explain down further. And, again, it's on me. I was just kind of being a little too uh, flippant in terms of how I was responding to it. But the idea is that if you look at the – who are the quote-unquote liberals on the court, right, with the, with the exception in many ways to uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who are considered the liberals on the court – Right. Are yesterday's conservatives. Right. Are yesterday's at least centrists. Um, so th- that's that's kind of more the, the, the point. And we have to be looking forward to what's going to be happening on the court because these decisions are going to matter. Right. So um, and again, not just putting someone who's got a good credential, you know, somebody that, you know, 
Oh, he's a doctor. You know, not like that, right? We don't need somebody simply. Oh, he's a doctor. No, somebody who's actually going to push and going to going to see things at a different kind of um, judicial perspective. So, anyways, that was the point. Um, but yeah, so that we had a Supreme Court ruling that it, again, it was narrowly written. Um, says it doesn't apply to a bunch of other cases that are pending or coming up, but it says no nope, because there was insufficient attention paid or deference given to this this. Uh, the baker's religious background and objections, then um, this was not going to count. So crazy, man. It's crazy. So uh, I mentioned this in the, in the top, uh, like at the top of the show today too, as well. Um, I'm going to have a link about this, about this report by Zilla research. Um, You know, I think that, Maybe uh, in the coming weeks we're going to do a show, especially we start th- thinking about um, the 2018 election, that not just what's happening on the week to week basis, but I'll start thinking a little bit about um, where we're going here. Because the Zillow research, I mean, Zillow, I mean, if you know them, there's, there's an app you get on your phone, it's like a real estate app and things, but they've got a, a research um, component, which basically they go out and they ask a whole bunch of experts in the kind of real estate market and, the, um, and kind of Wall Street and all this other kinds of stuff about. Um, the, like economic stability and so on. Where do they see the markets going, housing market and so on? And basically, uniformly, those folks came back and said, uh, no, nope, by 2020, we expect to have a recession, if, they, if assuming things move in the same direction. So that's a little disturbing. Um, last thing I want to kind of draw kind of specific, well, not last thing, I want to kind of end out today with uh, what's going on with um, – um, the, that the, uh, oh, we actually, actually have talked about that, but anyway, so and oh, and yeah, this segment today on this and talking a little bit about, um, a couple, again, disturbing attacks that we see, um, one in particular, we see, um, you know, again, it's part of this theme about, you know, autocratic regimes is that, um, Jahan, um, Jahan, I don't know exactly say his name, Wilcox, who's a spokesperson for EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt. Um, he basically called the journalist a piece of trash when asked for comments about some resignations, right? Um, that was pretty disturbing in my mind, um, especially because what this what this was, right, is that there had been a series. Okay, so basically what happened, there was um, an, an individual that worked for, um, um, for Scott Pruitt named um, Milan Hupp. Right. And she was, you know, paid extraordinarily well. Right. And was uh, there was some controversy and she recently resigned. She was a 26 year old top aide to Pruitt uh, who had worked for him in Oklahoma when he was attorney general there. And she was resigning after reports about her role in a whole series of scandals, scandals such as right using kind of like paid time to go out and search for a Trump hotel mattress for Scott Pruitt. <laughs> Literally. Right. Um, going out and doing things that seem to have no relevance whatsoever to um, the EPA or uh, what this was uh, supposed to, um, you know, what she should, well, potentially should be doing, but instead actually serving more as a way of kind of garnishing things for Scott Pruitt. Right. So the Atlantic uh, reported on this report, you know, kind of broke some of the stories on kind of um, kind of what was going on. And so Hupp just resigned and some other folks resigned too as well. So this reporter um, was um, uh, uh, Elena Plot, I guess her name is, right, um, was asking a follow up because they just resigned and basically said, well, do you have any comment about this? Right. And he comes out and he says, response, no response. It says, quote, you have a great day. You're a piece of trash. Right. He said on Twitter. Right. And Plot was just asking for an EPA statement about her scoop that tops Pruitt aide Milan, um, Milan Hupp had resigned from her position of director of scheduling. Right. So, again, we see this as a pattern of, you know, consistent abuse of the press um, um, by top administration officials. And a guy, Scott Pruitt, who's basically violated every ethics norm that you could possibly ever violate. Um, and he's still sitting there in office in the Trump, Trump regime. Man, but. It's crazy. You know, I, I was thinking about that, Sean, as like, you know, this is something that during the campaign that you kept on drawing attention to about the ways that journalists were being treated, um, um, whether we're talking about state politics here in Pennsylvania, um, I think of Scott Wagner kind of like, you know, pushing that guy over. Right. Um, and the kind of reception and the anti-journalistic fervor that's been going on. Yeah. No, um, I mean, they don't like having their shit call out of them. <laughs> I no. guess. No, but I think it's it's part of exactly what we're talking about. It's like you know one of the things that you got to do is you got to you got to you know suppress the media, 
Um, you suppress the media, and that becomes part of the, um, you know, the modus operandi, if you will, of, um, you know, the way these regimes um, take place. Well, I just want to close out this segment a little bit. Um, well, is, is there anything you got for this this part here, Sean, before I, go, I kind of move to close this out? Uh, no, I'm pretty good. All right. So there's this there was a great piece in the um, like we talked a little about Alexandria um, Ocasio-Cortez again. Please check her stuff out. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even mention that. We had that in our notes to kind of close out here, but we've already really talked about her, her um, work right at the top of the show. But um, what I want to d- just give a little bit of highlight from, there was a great piece that came out this week in the um, uh, Columbia Journalism Review. All right. It was by, um, by, let's see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Bah, 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 bah. Let me pull this up. <clears throat> this great piece by, close window. All right. Um, uh, Sarah Jones. Okay. And um, Sarah Jones was basically writing about, it was kind of a reflective piece, um, but also kind of pointing to something really important. And she talks about um, what the, the path for journalists today um, is an incredibly precarious, pre- precarious one. Right? We've seen this whole move um, really in every sector is to make life more precarious, especially in institutions that are most critical for um, democracy. So, for example, in higher education, Right. What we've seen is we've seen a shift right uh, over about a 40 year period right from um, uh, most faculty at in higher education institutions across the country. Right. At least at least 60 percent or higher right institutions were all uh, uh, tenured or tenure track. Right. Um, now we move to a situation where only 25 percent of faculty members at higher education institutions are, are tenured or tenure track. Right. And most of the people that carry the bulk of the load of teaching at higher education institutions across this country um, are adjuncts uh, working at, um, you know, um, barely livable wages and most cases, non livable wages, um, making poverty wages um, for some one of the kind of most wealthiest sectors of our country. Right. Um, And move towards precarity in higher education. We've seen this happen. Um, right across the board in virtually every industry that becomes important. K through 12 education. We've seen the kind of wholesale defunding of, of public education and the selling off to the kind of the profiteers, right? Making the lives of teachers, right? And those things all the more precarious, right? And now, again, we've seen the same dynamic happening in journalism um, where um, journalists, right, um, you know, uh, are barely making enough money um, to make ends meet. And why I wanted to highlight this piece by Sarah Jones is what Sarah Jones is kind of saying is like, you know, she talks about growing up kind of working class and basically wanting to get in journalism to tell stories about people in her community. Right. You know, and and other like that, to tell the stories of kind of working class, tell the stories of everyday Americans, tell the stories of what the impacts of policies and all this stuff have on actual, um, you know, uh, people and finding extraordinarily difficult because she finds herself having to work two or three other jobs in order to make ends meet in order to do the work of journalism. Right. Um, So what happens? What does she do? Well, she does that, right? But then she's competing with other people who are coming out of the Ivy Leagues, right, who come from a wealthy backgrounds, right, and can afford to do unpaid internships, can afford to do, um, you know, um, uh, um, work for free, right, and write for status, right, until they land a good job. And she basically talks about the class character of journalism right and basically saying so much of the reason why that our newspapers right and um our media do not focus um on the um the impacts of the impacts of policy and stuff on working class americans and we don't highlight social movements or people struggling for change has to do with the fact that there's a class character to what's happened in journalism but instead of it being the kind of a dogged um journalist who were kind of like coming up from um you know kind of through their hard work in order to get this done more and more what's happening is that um, major news outlets and even not so major news outlets are looking to, you know, first and foremost to Ivy League schools, right, as a way to, um, you know, stock their, their staff room because it's easy for them and their people are already familiar from their own class positions. And as we, so what happens then is that people who are trying to cover this stuff, like right, what we try to do here, right, are pushed further and further to the margins. And so she does a great, um, I think, service to journalism on this. And I think, um, 
She makes a good case in the end. I'll definitely check out her story. Um, but she concludes by this, and I thought this was this was important enough to share here um, before we close this out. So, you know, I'll just read the last two. Um, um, she's talking about unions in particular. Well, let me leave a couple things. She says deunionization is one of those um, facets in American things that has happened, right? It was happened to the electoral weakness of the Democratic Party and so on. And she says um, um, deunionization is one of those facets that has weakened the Democratic Party. And it, in turn, is linked to a decline in mining and manufacturing jobs. It's easy to criticize in hindsight, but it seems fair to say that if deunionization had received more national attention, if it had been linked repeatedly to economic losses and to organized labor status as an electoral engine for Democrats, perhaps the press would have anticipated Hillary Clinton's Rust Belt woes, right? Post-Trump, national interest in unions has increased. A recent statewide teacher walkout in West Virginia received coverage on CNN and headline news in the New York Times and Washington Post and other major outlets, right? And it's not clear what the benefit will be. And quote, labor stories are instructive because they're about working people who can always, who also be low income. It's hard to see how this will change as long as Trump is the most popular hook. The stories of the poor possess their own texture and weight. Poverty is a series of surprises, most of them horrible. Life for the poor means careening from one plot twist to another while the world looks straight through you. And this is how she ends her piece. It shouldn't be this way. And in journalism, at least, the solutions are obvious. Pay a living wage. Openly advertise your jobs and send the entry-level listings to state schools as well as the Ivy League. Reconsider keeping your entire staff in an expensive coastal city. Don't limit class or the various beats in this category to election year hits or special investigations. These stories deserve everyday attention for what they tell us about the cracks in American facade. Make it easier for poor folks to enter your world and we'll even tell those stories for you. We're resilient, and after all, we make damn good journalists, right? And that hit me for a couple reasons, right? One, I thought that it was a a super kind of insider narrative, right? We got to see some of the stuff, and you're telling that this is what that experience has been. This has also been one of the reasons that that I found a Raging Chicken Press right from the get-go, right? The idea that we need to find ways of building sustainable models for telling these things. And Sean will be the first one to tell you. Right. Um, what we do here at Raging Chicken in terms of like funding journalism is not in any way a sustainable model at this point. Right. It's not sustainable because Sean, look, Sean should be able to live off what he does for Raging Chicken, period. Right. Just like anybody else who writes for this. Right. Who wanted to put in full time stuff. Right. I should be able to do this full time. But it's not true. Right. We can't. Right. Um, So the model that we've been kind of hoping to build and trying to build and it's when working slowly is building this membership model. Right. That would basically say, look, we need the community to invest in this because we've seen what happens when newspapers go private and they become stock options and all that kind of stuff. Or they become under the control of one or two individuals. Right. Which then kind of like hamper your ability to say things we want to be able to don't want to be accountable to anybody but the people who are invested in progressive politics, right? And that means you, right? Um, And that's why we've gone to this membership model. And like, look, we're going to look for, and look, I would love for people to kind of tell us what you think about like other ideas, other options, right? Um, For how to do this. But right now we're going into a 2018 election, which is potentially going to be, is going to make or break whether or not the house is going to flip to democratic control, right? Right here in Pennsylvania, Right. What should be happening right now is that we should be on the ground in every major community, right? Every like play across this state, like talking to the people who are building the resistance. Right. But we can't do that on our current budget. We can only do that with help from you. Right. Um, and so, again, I, 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 you know, thanks, Sarah Jones, so much for writing that piece. I want to say, look, the best thing that you can do to help us with this is right to become a member of Raging Chicken Press, right? Help us, right? Keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement, right? Um, become a member by going to patreon.com slash RC Press. Become a member for as little as five bucks a month. Five bucks a month, folks, right? Um, you think about the kind of the stuff that you spend on beer, on coffee, right? Um, or just kind of like whatever, 
right? And not every day, just five bucks a month, right? You know, again, I want to thank Connor for coming in this week once again at a $10 a month level. I can't tell you how much that helps, right? If we had nine other people, 10 people like Connor join at the $10 a month level, we would hit our next, our, our next membership goal, right? And be able to again, take that next step um, towards building a sustainable model. We're a long way off from building a sustainable model, but if we keep this going and we keep moving and you continue to step up to the plate, become members of Raging Chicken Press, um, we can help, again, shine a light on um, what we should be doing, right, and investing in the infrastructure that we need for social change. But anyways, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, reminding you again, going to patreon.com slash RC Press, become a member of Raging Chicken Press today. Uh, we will be back right after this break with a little of a focus on Pennsylvania and good old Scotty boy. <laughs> I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1904. That was the day that John Carley, a union miner, was shot down in Duttonville, Colorado. Carley was part of a strike in the Cripple Creek gold mining region. The miners had gone out on strike in support of workers at the Standard Mill in Colorado City, which processed the mined ore. Colorado Governor Peabody was determined to break the strike. He called in the state militia, who joined forces with Company Army gun thugs, with 1,000 rifles and 60,000 rounds of ammunition to back them up. General Sherman Bell, a veteran of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Rider squad in the Spanish-American War, led the National Guard. During the strike, one of General Bell's deputies is said to have declared, To hell with the Constitution! We aren't going by the Constitution! This pretty much summed up General Bell's approach to the conflict. The militia began to round up Union miners. More than 1,500 miners were captured and given a so-called trial by the militia. 238 of these miners were then deported from the region. They were shipped by train to Denver, Kansas, and New Mexico and warned not to return. The militia learned of a group of pro-Union workers at a small encampment known as Dunville. General Bell loaded up more than 100 militiamen and company deputies on a train and headed for the camp. There they exchanged gunfire with the miners. 65 miners, armed with just 10 guns among them, had little chance against the well-armed company men. John Carley was killed, and 14 miners were arrested. The Union was crushed in the sights of a thousand guns. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. I'm in a waste management business. Everybody immediately assumes you're mobbed up. It's a stereotype, and it's offensive. It's offensive, Sean. It's offensive, right? The words of our next governor of Pennsylvania, sort ah. of. <laughs> Senator Soprano himself. I could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. <laughs> right, I so, uh, been... yeah, so I guess uh, I, Scott Wagner's given up this week. He resigned, right? Yeah, he, re he resigned from the Senate uh, earlier this week. And, of course, there were some puff pieces coming out by organizations, not going to talk about them, that were – listing off some of his accomplishments and what he has done to the Senate. Um, in my opinion, he hasn't done a fucking thing <laughs> besides, yeah. besides drag the Senate further to the right by knocking people out that he disagrees with. Um, he's propping up the word like, yeah, Wolf said it right. He's propping up the very Western Harrisburg. He's finding, he's financing the right wing uh, takeover of the Senate. He uh, is financing people uh, primaries and going after uh, more moderate Republicans. Um, He's dragging the Senate to the left. He didn't pass a single – there was not there's not a single bill with his name on it that was signed in, into legislation uh, with, in, during his time. I mean he, he, he's a reformer who reformed nothing. And wh what he was famous about was uh, shooting up skirt vids, videos outside his office with the cameras taped to the wall. Uh, we all remember that a few years ago. Yes, and um, going, after, uh, going after working families. And I just want to say that um, shooting off memes, <laughs> <laughs> comparing him to the Penguin from Batman, is not going low. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you saying, man? I, I don't know what you. I don't know what you mean. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> so, so, uh, I guess, uh, so, all right, I guess we gotta start from the, the beginning. Start, uh, let's start from the very beginning. All right, so this week, it's Wagner, a very we, good place. <laughs> uh, Wagner, this week, Wagner was walking around the Capitol on Monday with a cane. Uh, he looked like the Monopoly man. All he was missing was his top hat and monocle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I mean, he was hitting the steps pretty hard. I mean, like going down and he, then he admitted he had arthroscopic knee surgery and then in his farewell interview, which I did not get to uh, record, but I saw it on, I saw the video of it. Uh, he was talking about how he had leg surgery done, arthroscopic knee surgery, has knee scope, whatever. And um, he was running up and down all these steps and the doctor told him to stop it and he had to retake his uh, prescription pain pills, pain pills. And um, probably he was just, you know, was flying high that day in the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to hit those steps without feeling it. I don't know. I think I think the cane's a prop, but <clears throat> you think the cane's a prop? <laughs> we all know there's going to be an issue if he has a top hat and monocle coming up. Man, I, I'm definitely doing some Photoshop work at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so he resigned from uh, the Senate this week, um, and you know, one of his first political stunts was uh, going into a very black neighborhood black part of philadelphia going to malcolm x park uh and doing a, a bunch of live videos from malcolm x park uh browbeating the city that these people aren't be able to live with pride and dignity because the grass is now cut uh the city officials said they cut they mowed the lawn uh they mowed the grass may 25th which is like two weeks ago and they mowed it on monday and uh you know funny thing happens in the spring when it rains all the time oh, you mean, what happens i mean <laughs> it really it's like uh, the, 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 yeah the grass clears what 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 <laughs> huh Wait, and you mean, and we wait, and you mean we we don't have basically um, kind a of like a, a public a, a public infrastructure built so that every single park has its own caretaker that is there to do nothing but take care of the park, like and every single thing. Is that true? I, I mean, I, we don't have that to no. watch every blade of grass grown. No, we don't. <laughs> we, we 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 have this we have this thing called the Parks Department that takes care of all the parks and cuts them on a scheduled basis. My God, Sean. <sighs> My gosh, how how incompetent and disgusting is that, that we have a parks department that would allow the grass to grow? I know. And cut them every two weeks. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Especially in the spring. Right. Come on, yeah. man. Yeah. When it's raining out all the time. No, but so, he was pretty disgusting, right? I'm, I, I, yeah. I mean, he was pretty disgusting. But, you know, he said he would have mowed the grass if his knee wasn't hurting him. <laughs> My God. He would have done it himself. Right? Yes. The great white hope would have come to Malcolm X Park, right? And <laughs> mowed the lawn himself. Had it been for my knee. It had been for my knee. Like, I think like really uh, we should get off I mean, um I guess where we should start off as that is saying that this is, you know, a fucking dog whistle of all dog whistles to start off his campaign right. uh outside of the Senate. Exactly. I mean, this is Look, I mean, I look at that, right? You look at that I mean, pretty move. Much you're thumbing the eye of Jim Kenny. You're thumbing the eye of Vincent Hughes, is the senator uh, in that park, and you're thumbing your eye. At, you're 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 sticking your thumb in, like the, all the legislators of that area. You're p doing nothing but pissing people off, and you're doing it like, Haha, look, we're we're we're, we're going to go into this black neighborhood and do this, and then you know use all these tropes of like how they can't live with any dignity and stuff like this. Dude, dude, this is the guy that like said, shut up, wear a belt and make sure your pants is around. It isn't around your ass. Yep. Uh, when he was talking about uh, fast food workers. Yep. Who are predominantly African-American or minorities. Well, you know, look, frankly, what this reminded me of, right. And it, it just rings all those bells, all these bells right now. So if, if you remember, I mean, it's famous. There was this, um, this, uh, Neshoba County fair speech, right. By Ronald Reagan, when Ronald Reagan was decided he was going to run for president. Right. So it, the first place that he went out, right. To kind of announce this and do this stuff was in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Right. And he went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, and he gave this kind of speech about running for president and about states' rights, about how we need to defend states' rights, right? Now, he didn't come out and say, 
I think we need the Ku Klux Klan back to start lynching black people again. No, he didn't have to say that. Right. But it was all in the dog whistle, in the performance and the construction of that. Why? Because Philadelphia, Mississippi was a town that was associated with the murders of 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 uh, was it Cheney, Goodman and, and Schwerner in right? 1964. Right. The famous kind of murders um, of, the, of the of those kind of um, that, that were kind of you know, covered as part of the, as part of the civil rights movement in the South. Right. So he goes to that place to give that speech and talk about states rights. Right. And I'm like looking at Wagner and I'm saying. He goes to Malcolm X Park, right, to talk about, you know, to to launch his campaign and talk about, like, these black people who just can't get their stuff together. And it mimics every single or echoes every single speech that he's given about kind of like, you know, people with their droopy pants and kind of not working and the laziness on their cell phones, all the stuff that he's been doing in the Senate since he's been there. Yeah. And one of the things uh, I think we should talk about, um, we really haven't been able to digest who exactly is on um, his campaign team, but some of the people on his campaign um, include, uh, you know, we're working for Ed Gillespie uh, last year. His his communications director was a communications assistant for Ed Gillespie, who was running for governor down in Virginia. Uh, Ed Gillespie ran a very uh, racist campaign, overtly racist, with the dog whistles and going after undocumented immigrants and stuff this like this uh, before uh, this communications director came on. Um, you know, you had Wagner going after a bunch of the immigrants. Um, and now this is really like his first stunt um, that he that he wanted to that he wanted to do was just thumb thumb, put his thumb in the eyes of the people. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yes, uh, of them. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So let me just here's the echo. So here's this is a, a little bit of sound about from Wagner from from back a little bit further. So you can hear the echoes of what the, what he's doing here. So there's any doubt in his mind. So this is just kind of like we ran this sound before um, kind of a while ago when we were talking about Wagner. But I'm just going to run this again. This is Wagner on some worker so, stuff. Yep. So the workers that are down here in the hallways looking for work, I'd be happy to give them some numbers of I should say that when he's talking about the workers down there, these are workers that were coming forward and arguing for a $15 an hour minimum wage, right? So that, um, and so now he's kind of like going and grandstanding about those workers on the floor of the state Senate. So the workers that are down here in the hallways looking for work, I'd be happy to give them some numbers of employers in York that would that probably pay wages somewhere between 12 and $15 an hour. But there are a couple things required. Number one, you would have to have an alarm clock, and you would have to be able to get out of bed. You would be able to have to pass a drug test, and you would have to have some work ethic. I don't go into fast food restaurants every now and then, but maybe I'll stop for a coffee. And, and periodically, you'll notice somebody behind the counter on a cell phone, either talking on the cell phone or texting, and that's clearly against the company policy. You know, you'll, you'll look around, and, and you know, anywhere you go, there are younger workers with their pants hanging down, rear ends hanging out. They really don't care about their appearance. I don't care if you pay somebody $20 an hour. If they have a certain behavior, it's not going to change their behavior. And this is realism. We have given out so many government benefits over the last five years that we have more people riding the wagon than pulling the wagon. There you go. That's, I mean, that's basically his playbook, which he just reenacted down in Malcolm X Park. Yeah. Crazy, man crazy i this is the this is the the dog whistle politics that we're going to have to endure with in, endure for the next uh up and through november good old scott wagner man good old scott wagner um so so you got you know so you decide to throw your hat in the uh the twitter sphere on this one right um and uh kind of uh go after a wagner a little bit uh right yes i decided to do that <laughs> and it was well received, I guess. Yes. Um, so I put out a meme of Scott Wagner with his uh, foot, with the way he was uh, had his foot propped up on the lawnmower, and how he was uh, resting his ass on his cane, <laughs> <laughs> and holding it and everything. And um, 
Sorry, that's Sean taking a pause because he just got an alert that he's got a message coming in. So don't worry. Sean will finish what he was going to say after <laughs> he stops paying attention to the, the message he just me got. On the, on a, all right. It's so, like a dog. I swear to God. You, if you could see him right now, it's like freaking Pavlov's dog, right? He's like in the middle of a story and it goes, ding! And he starts salivating and staring at his phone, right? And like in the middle of a sentence. And I'm sitting here like, you're telling people a story about what's going on here. And you're fucking like... <laughs> <laughs> so, so okay. So there, 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 there. There's this photo of Wagner. Uh, the way he's like propped up, holding his cane, with his leg propped up on the lawnmower, uh, the riding mower, him in the, the cane in the background, and then it's juxtaposed to uh, Danny DeVito's portrayal of the Penguin from Batman. <laughs> nice. And, and and all it says is like, "Will the real PAGOP gubernatorial nominee please stand up?" <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, people saw people really jumped on you for that. I mean, not I mean, I don't want to say everybody jumped up, but I mean, it's like, yeah, a few people really jumped on you and like took issue with the, with the meme. Uh, yeah, I mean, people, some people like us childish, and uh, I'll pull up one. Um, this is adolescent, focused on the issues, not on photoshopped photographs. Tom Wolf fights for severance tax. And Wagner will fight against it. Hashtag facts matter. Yeah, because that that'll that'll really win people over. But that's uh, uh but you know, look, look, Sean, I, I get it. You were being kind of like, you know, kind of like I don't know, like an adolescent fat shaming prick, and and then <laughs> and so, um, you know, I Hold think on, my phone's going off. Can I... <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> No, what, like, what, I, was I, it... respond, I respond by this like, yeah, like, listen, calling uni, union officials Hitler or Stalin is adolescent. So it's going after people's paychecks. Uh, last time I checked, a meme never hurt anyone. Right. I think, well, look, I, I looked at it like this. I, it's funny, you know, again, I, I guess if you're really worried, if it, it, what's front and center in your mind is about is about weight and kind of like stuff like that. And you saw that picture. I can understand why that you might you think what is the me- is the message right that you're just kind of making fun of his weight um but you know (laughs) i didn't see that at all i mean maybe this is this is because i've watched all the batman movies right um every and i've watched the batman series even when i was a kid and stuff and i know that the penguin right is an evil little kind of cretin and i think monster yeah, well, it, that's the key, right? The key thing is that in like, and that's why I thought, that's why I laughed at it. Cause I'm like, oh man, this is a great juxtaposition. So in Batman Returns, right? When you've got, um, when you've got the penguin, which is where that picture is from, right? In Batman Returns, the, the whole plot move there is that, um, you know, the penguin lives underground, right? He was rejected as a kid and he's kind of grown up in the sewers and all this stuff. And he gets coaxed out by this kind of super wealthy, like Uber donor guy, right? Right. Um, to basically reemerge from after he's captured and things like that, but reemerge from like the underground, right, to actually run for mayor of Gotham City. Right. <laughs> and there's this big speech in there where the penguin is talking about how, like, you know, it's time for me to reemerge, right? And to take back my birthright, right? And all this stuff. And he kind of cleans himself up a little bit, puts on the top head of a monocle. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then comes out to try to run a campaign. Right. And then eventually, right. Somebody kind of like hurts his feelings. Right. So then he just goes off on a terror anyways and decides to kind of capture all the firstborn <laughs> children of Gotham City's wealth people anyways. But that's a, that's a side of thing. But so when I saw that, that's what came to my mind initially. Right. The narrative of kind of like this guy emerging from the depths of the sewer. Right. To try to make himself respectable to run for this. Right. Um, and Scott Wagner. Right? Yes. So, and then so uh, Mike's like, uh, retweet, which I think he was being a little snarky. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> um, you put, uh, this is not going high when they go, when they go low. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I put I responded with, like, I'm sorry for insulting Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> man. <clears throat> oh man, whatever. Well, you know, I, I don't know. It's and, like, so, <laughs> you know, I look, like I get look there there's 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 a uh, you know and people are finally starting to write about this um is that there are people and they've written most about mostly about the um about th- this kind of like the never trumpers on the right um who basically reject or kind of like disagree with Trump and really what they disagree with Trump over has has virtually nothing to do with it's policy it's the substance of going along with the policy right it, it, no it, it's it's decorum Really? I mean, they they think that you should kind of like, you know, take lunches away from kids. Right. Um, politely. 
<laughs> right? They think that, you know, you should kind of destroy um, kind of public infrastructure, um, like through the manners of, you know, um, a, 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 of, of an elegant dinner, right? That kind of crap, right? Um, that's what they're objecting to. They're objecting to form and not content. Um, and but this is also true um, on the left, right? Or we're kind of well among a lot of Democrats, right? Who all they want to really do, and this is troubling to me. All they really want to do is get back to a time where, you know, we're polite, <laughs> right? Please, sir. Or, or you please, Don't sir. Don't take away my lunch. Right. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Right. I mean, it's like you know. Again, <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, sir. May yeah. I have another? You know, I mean that really. I mean the idea that. Like politics was never about that though, and that's the thing that like you know I, I come from this like people politics has been involved with like rats fucking and backstabbing people for as long as the thing. I mean like Christ, there was a duel between you know between like what a sitting vice president or like uh, what, like I mean people killed themselves. I mean we have been doing this for years now. I get that, like, the liberals are like, oh, well, you know, like, professionals and stuff like this. The people in the resistance, the hashtag the resistance. Oh, he's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, like, this, 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 there's, there's this modicum, there, there, there's this, like, moniker of decorum. Right. Uh, simply because we are professional, right? right. We're not, like, because we're, we're doing this as a professional class, so we should. Oh, he's a doctor. <laughs> when, right. Like, you know, like no, it's you know sometimes when they go low, you not punch down, punch, punch down. <laughs> you got the high ground, <laughs> use it, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I get it. Look, we you know we we have this we have this thing on on the left, right? L liberals, kind of especially centrist, kind of you know, everyday Democrats and things like this. It's like you know. This has taken me, I have to say, look, I, like, I this is, like this is me being a scumbag. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not being scummy over this. Like, it's not like it's a like a really shitty meme or something. No, like, dude, the guy uh, like he, he, like this man deserves our respect. Why? Because he was a senator, uh, not because he called, um, you know, compared union officials and workers to Hitler and Stalin on the Senate floor. Uh, not because he said he's going to stand in the back of the room with a baseball bat and threaten people. Or when he's talking about Governor Wolf, but we have him on his, what we have him on his back. Now it's time to put our foot on his throat. Like, I mean, like, yeah, you know, this guy uses like the, these, <laughs> I mean, like there's nothing, uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing where this guy deserves respect. Right. And I think that and I look I mean, and I, I look that million. is that is the reality of of like bare knuckle politics, right? And I think that look, the the liberals, right, in particular, right, we the, you know, there's these icons of how they should appear, right? How presidents and how first family and also should appear, right? And so for the longest time the Kennedys, right, were the model, right? Forget Chappaquiddick, right? Forget like, you know, um all the kind of crazy stuff, but it was about the performance. It was about Jackie. Oh my God, Jackie. She's like, so she's got so much grace and Kenny's beautiful and all the family and all this kind of stuff. And look at what they did. They played football and touch football and along. all this kind of stuff became this kind of this, this celebrity informed way of thinking about what we should be doing. And look, and, and you know how you deal with other people and so on. And that became important, but the Obamas came along, right? And the Obamas, were really that next that the next version of the Kennedys and that and that kind of trope, <laughs> right? Because the, I mean, look, there is no doubt, right? If you're going to talk about decorum, if you're going to talk about kind of like class, great, class, holy crap! I mean, you cannot put any anybody above the Obamas. I mean, the Michelle Obama, um, a Barack Obama, the way that they treated people, every little memoir that comes out about like about you know what it was like working or the Obama administration, everybody like almost universally says this. And he felt like he had to do it because of the color of his skin, putting that extra two, three hundred percent, like go above and beyond because he was the first black person doing this. Exactly. Well, you know what? Again, I, I, I think that I mean, that's how he lived his life. Example. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you know Michelle Obama, when she, that was where the, the whole you know you know when they go low, we go high. That was hers, right? Michelle Obama saying that she would say that to her kids and say that you know that was what she and Barack and you know, also Obama went say. low, who had a propensity of going low that whole entire primary, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, you know, you can say that. I'm not going to go there with you because I think, look, I think that I think Hillary Clinton, I think Hillary Clinton has, you know, she has tried to uh, kind of run her career 
right, um, by focusing on policy and focusing on um, kind of like argument and data and things like this. I don't agree with a lot of the Clinton's policies and Hillary Clinton's policies on some things, um, but I will give her a ton of credit. And again, it, it, it's borne out by a lot of people in her campaign and stuff about working for her. I mean, the la- the ends of the campaign got a little dicey in her campaign um, just in terms of staff and things. But um She's respectful. She listens. Right. And she kind of engages people in a way that are I really think that when she comes across and she got most of her criticisms, a lot of it came from um, from first her campaign. And I think that a lot. And also, it's like the type of thing where, you know, she wouldn't go low when Trump went low. Yeah, exactly. Like imagine like we were talking about this yesterday. Imagine if like Joe Biden was running for for office. That's a lot of malarkey. (laughs) I mean, Joe Biden would have, would would have nipped that shit in the bud real often, real early, and if he didn't, he would just drag it, drag your body across the floor in it. Like, I mean, he wouldn't care. Like, I mean, there's like, but he'd do it with a smile, right? Yeah, and, and there's I, plenty of people out there who do that. I mean, like my this 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 meme is not like it. You're, you're it's. It, I'm not punching down at anyone. Like, you know what I mean? I'm yeah. not punching down on a on someone who like a troll or I'm not punching down on, you know, someone who is in the me too movement <clears throat> as we'll see like just in a minute. <laughs> in just a minute. Um, but like, no, you're punching up at someone. Right. Like it's, it, 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 it's exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think I, I'm glad you said that because I want to be clear. But when I'm ta- when I was talking, like my thing, I said, you know, when, you know, uh, when, th- when they go low punch down, I, I didn't mean it. In the, I didn't mean it in the way that you were talking about. I was just yeah. meaning it in terms of kind of like the you know playing around with the metaphor of high and low. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's like you know objectively, right? Where's the power? And I get it. Like people are really invested, especially liberals are especially really invested in on how we conduct ourselves. And I think that's absolutely important. I talk to my kids all the time about that. The last thing in the world I would do is to say to my kids like this is how you should treat people. No, we're talking about a very specific instance of a very particular kind of dynamic. When you've got a rising fascist like Scott Wagner, right, who has shown that he will, under every circumstance, lie his way to get to office. Right. Uh, Yeah. And dog whistle and. Right. And we should we should find ways, right, to expose that. Right. Because in a sense, how we treat people, you know, (laughs) I, I, I'm a big fan of this, right? I've always grown up with that golden rule, right? Treat other people in terms of the ways that you want to be treated, right? But I've always had a coda to that, right? It's like treat people the way that you want to be treated, semicolon, right? <laughs> Until you get to the point where you start to have to, you have to start treating the treating other people the way that they treat you, right? Uh, and that's the same. It's the bully logic. Right. Is that, yes, you don't start from a position. I talk with my kids about this all the time. Right. When they have trouble with friends at school and things like this, or there's someone who's picking on them. It's like you don't start from like, you know, you find every way to just kind of like play on their ground. No, you try the other routes. But when the other routes are not working. Right. Then you got to take them to task. Right. And then you've got to go on the offense. Right. And not hide behind. Right. You know, the comfortable place of, um, I don't know, a positive sense of decorum so yeah crazy so uh so sean um the one thing that we do have going for us though is that um um you know we've got a a a strong leader in the pennsylvania democratic party um that will definitely um um is is definitely now kind of prepared right and is preparing every day um to uh you know take us forward in 2018 I don't. So the thing is, the state Democratic Party will be picking their leader. It seems like this weekend uh, coming yeah. up, state committee. Um, the acting state committee. Uh, she passed away. She was kind of given that role uh, after Marcel Groen stepped aside for her role in transforming Pennsylvania politics and doing it at a time when um, there was not many women involved in politics. Yes. Um, now, one of the people is uh, you know. Um, Marcel Groen, he was forced to step down. So I, I think he was trying to run for Montgomery County uh, Democratic Party to lead that again, which is, you know, Montgomery County is one of the most uh, pretty much like one of the more powerful positions to have within the Democratic Party. I mean, being a county commissioner from Montgomery County 
goes a lot further than being a county commissioner from the middle of like central Pennsylvania. Like this is a usually like a stepping stone sort of seat. And we saw that with um, Josh Shapiro. Right. Um, you know, the politics of Montgomery County, uh, especially within the party, is a pretty important place to look just because of how powerful that county is as a whole uh, when it comes to money and the people running it. And so Marcel Groen sends out a people telling them to choose wisely uh, with who you're voting for, for the thing. Um, and he, you know, he emailed, he sent out a list of accomplishments as his chairmanship uh, when he was, you know, in Pennsylvania, pretty much like uh, 21 years Montgomery County Democratic Party chair. Um, he was, you know, they gained 150,000 registered Democrats while the Republicans lost 50,000. I, I think that's more demographic change. Uh, he happened to be in office when the sun was going up, you know, taking credit for the sun rising and the sun setting. Yes, well, <laughs> someone's got to turn on the light, Sean. Someone's got to turn on the lights. <laughs> so, I mean, but um, like he said, we had uh, one white woman uh, judge out of 22 in the county. We, today we have nine. Uh, we had no African-Americans on the bench. Uh, we have three. Right. Uh, other two county commissioner elections have held uh, have had one female, one uh, male. Um, you know, the last woman to serve in Congress uh, came from Montgomery County, which is Allison Schwartz. Uh, during her time in Congress, um, she was uh, state rep, state senator, county commissioner. And uh, <clears throat> so then that, that's how, and then he goes into uh, this list of accomplishments. Um, he says, well, one thing he says, I despise people who abuse others. I have zero tolerance for that, and I always have. But I also have to believe that there are, are, there are gradations, and an inappropriate remark is not an assault. Finally, I am a lawyer who also believes that in this country uh, you have the right to defend yourself uh, before you are convicted. Um, he talks about the instance with Dan Leach. Um, and then he says, uh, to prove my point, I look at the star witness uh, for the stories, not saying the name. Uh, charged someone with uh, during our convention of inappropriate sexual touching at the hotel uh, bar Friday, 2.30. Everyone, this is a very highly popularized story uh, within the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania. Uh, you can look it up what happened at the convention and you can see which uh, side you're going to go. Uh, but Groen decides to attack uh, the accuser in this and basically goes on. She is living proof of why people have a right to defend themselves uh, before being judged. Basically, uh, he said, uh, she, like, she insists she charged someone uh, during our, our convention of inappropriate sexual touching at the hotel bar at 2.30 a.m. Fortunately, uh, there was an eyewitness and videotapes, all of which uh, showed nothing happening. Um, the police investigated, and that was uh, their conclusion. She insisted uh, that the person who allegedly acted inappropriately be charged anyway, only to be acquitted at trial. Uh, she's living proof as to why a uh, right to defend uh, themselves uh, before being judged. Now, the person who was involved in this, she had to go through weeks, almost a month, month and a half, two months of yelling at the police and yelling at the district attorney's office to charge this person. Yep. And this is a traumatic event, even though she was found, the person was found not guilty. This is still a traumatic event. And he is still attacking an accuser of sexual assault within the Democratic Party. Right. And he's doing this. He says, I love the Democratic Party, uh, what it is, what it stands for. I believe, unlike most, I have walked the walk and not just talked the talk. Accusations and words are cheap. Ac actions are not. If anyone wants to judge me, uh, look at my actions and long record. You will find them un unequal in this state in terms of gender and racial equality in the party i ensured that everyone had a real seat at the table and this is also after two years of dragging their feet on not having a comprehensive sexual assault policy or a sexual um <clears throat> harassment policy within the democratic party yep and this is after he came out and defended dan leach uh for a sexual harassment a uh, friend of his and after Dale Leach called someone that we know a wrecking ball of hate and basically said there was nothing going on here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is fucking disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is coming from the people. This is, this is coming from the Dom Costa, the, uh, Paul Costa, the machine aspect of the Democratic Party. And these machines are being busted before our eyes. Yep. 
one more reason, one more reason to tear it down, folks. Um, and w- w- we're in a unique pops, uh, uh, position these days that it's not just about tearing down, but you got people who are actively building up an alternative. And uh, you know, you highlighted right from the right from the begin right from the beginning. We saw um, a whole bunch of like this know, is punching down. This is adolescent bullshit. Right. This is this is what it's like to punch down on someone. That's you know, exactly not, right. Not popping off a meme at Scott Wagner or something like that. Right. And so, I mean, yeah, exactly. And what 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 blows my mind about uh, about what Marcel Groen just did there was that there and, and everything else that was said, right, there was no need to go after that person. Right. He did not need to do that, even if everything he said there, he believes. Right. And everything he said, he believed he doesn't need to make that a showcase of what he says, but he does. <laughs> right. So there you go. There you go. Um, that's one more reason why the old boys network needs to go. Right. There you yeah. go. Crazy, man. Um, I got a few things. I got a few things that go. Well, any, anything else on that? And you want anything else you want to go with that? No, no, I just, I, I got the rant out that I need to get out about this. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's something that like, it's, you know, he decided to do this. It clearly shows you that he has not learned. And that, you know, he's still seeking an influential position within the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania. And also at, in his letter, which I did not post online, he takes a swing at reporters for trying to drag him down. Oh, God. Oh, he's a doctor. <laughs> Actually, a lawyer. Lawyer. Yep. I, I wish Michelle Wolf said that, too, as well. <laughs> oh, God. It's what people will yeah. do to maintain decorum. All this was done because as chairman, I created systems that uh, all who wanted to run for office uh, could try and see nothing and nobody, including reporters, can take those accomplishments away from me. Yeah, let's recall. Let's recall what this, you know, a Democratic Party in this state that had systematically refused to run candidates um, in the in. You know, the bulk of the districts, right? Because, uh, well, they're just too conservative. We're not going to even try to build anything there. Like a Democratic Party that basically, like, you know, just said, okay, you got a political machine out there in Pittsburgh. Okay, so you go ahead and have it. So that it means we don't have to do anything. A Democratic Party basically said, okay, well, if you want to run, we're not going to help you until you show us that you've got the donors in order to run. Right. Um, a Democratic Party that kind of systematically excludes women from, you know, uh, it, you know, its leadership positions and developing from there. You know, that's what's been going on for there. So you can say whatever you want, man. Um, I think that, you know, the up and coming folks are just going to wipe the slate clean. And that's and that's what we need to do. Right. We need to move on to the next generation of politics in Pennsylvania when that returns to the kind of uh, so, some of the militancy of the past, uh, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so a couple things. One, uh, just. Uh, Please do check out the stuff about the, um, the stuff on the Catholic Church. That the report is coming out. Josh Shapiro um, basically said that um, there was basically this case. There's been a grand jury hearing. There's a, a 800 page report um, on on uh, the abuse of kids um, and uh, um, by Catholic priests and um, some of the laity and some of the kind of cover ups that have been taking place by um, leaders in uh, six out of the eight uh, dioceses, Catholic dioceses in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, um, and, and two of those dioceses have already gone through like i think it was altoona and philadelphia that's already been out right so these are the the remaining ones um that have come under scrutiny now too as well and the catholic church has been trying to suppress that Um, and this is going to be a huge scandal this is going to be bigger than the philadelphia yeah you wait you wait to see what goes on this is why i've been hearing uh rumbles in harrisburg that this is going to be one of the biggest scandals within the catholic church uh to date and it's going to be larger than one that happened in boston yep exactly Uh, from, from from what i'm from what i've been hearing from sources just chattering in Harrisburg. Uh, they're bracing for this to be a huge report. One of the most, one of the biggest stories of, of yeah, it's going to be. And so what, um, basically, Again, and I'm living here out in Harrisburg for, yeah, right. No, exactly. It's that, you know, what we've, what we've seen here is that the, um, the, the, the church has tried to basically say that, no, they need more time to review this stuff. And they're just playing a delay game. And the kind of judge came down, PA judge came down and said, Hey, Nope, sorry. Look, the, um, the protection of kids, Right. And the welfare of kids kind of going forward and that kind of history is more important than you being able to kind of get your ducks in a row. 
Um, so we're going to move forward. So Josh Shapiro basically said that um, they're going to release the full report to the public, 800-page report, um, at the end of June. Um, so when, we're going to come back to that when, when the report is released. We had a chance to kind of look at some of it because um, it is just be, be prepared for it, folks. This one's going to be explosive, and it's going to be disturbing, right? Um, and all the more reason to kind of like we start holding those in power accountable, right? Um, I don't give a shit where they come from. Um, so there's that. So there's that. And also the other thing that um, what – draw my attention this week just goes back to some of the stuff we talked about journalism in the past segment and the pittsburgh post gazette um they've been basically uh spiking a bunch of political cartoons by one of their longtime cartoonists uh rob rogers um who's basically been writing from there i think it was like over 20 years right um he's been working for them um oh actually well yes it's 1993 uh and he's he had six cartoons killed in a row and this is coming from um, the the inquirer uh, philly inquirer so this is at rogers who has drawn on cartoons for the Post Gazette since 1993 has seen six cartoons killed in a row by Keith Burris, who took over the newspaper's editorial director in March when the paper's editorial board merged with its sister paper, the Toledo Blade. The cartoons included criticisms of President Trump and of the NFL's decision to prohibit players from protesting racial injustice um, during the national anthem. Right. Um, so he's been posting these um, anyways on social media. Right. Um, but the paper has refused to do this. And this has been a long time creep that's been happening in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, um, which they've been actually silencing because the, the owner basically is a strong um, um, proponent of Trump. Um, so they've been spiking some of the uh, criticism of that, both in its editorial pages um, and in its political cartoons. So, um, again, this stuff is real, folks. Um, <clears throat> so watch what's going on. Um, one of the things I want to mention before, I know Sean wants to kind of talk a little bit about some of the, um, the poor people's campaign and things like this. Um, and I think, but before we get there, I forgot to mention this in the intro and this is a big deal. You remember we reported on the PA promise, um, which was legislation that was going to be, um, proposed, um, for free college tuition. And, um, it's, you know, we've been kind of looking around when's this going to actually drop? Well, this week it did. Um, finally, um, legislators in both, and, and this is from Penn Live, um, legislators in the both state and house introduced legislation to make a tuition free, um, um, to make state-owned college, tuition-free at state-owned colleges, state-related universities, community colleges. So this is, quote, the bills House Bill 2444 and Senate Bill 1111 mm -hmm. conjointly called the PA promise would cover tuition and fees for recent high school graduates whose families earn $110,000 or less at, um, to attend any of the state's 14 state-run universities and state-related institutions. It also promises to cover the cost of tuition and fees for the 14 public community colleges and cover room and board at any community college, state-owned or state-related institution if their family earns less than $48,000. And it was introduced, um, Senator, this is Vincent Hughes, was basically one of the major proponents of this. Um, again, this is very similar, like we said before, modeled after what happened in New York State. Um, although it's interesting, in the final bill, it brings it down to $110,000 as opposed to um, kind of a higher level on it, but still. So there's still, you know, crit criticisms to be made on this, but this is a huge step forward. Um, we're going to look into kind of specifics of the bill. And again, we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about this next week when we have an opportunity to kind of adjust some of the stuff. But this is a big deal. This is, you know, we've talked about what um, the PA Student Power Network has done this. My own union, ABSCUF, has been kind of gotten in behind this. Um, this is a huge moment. Um, this is something that every single Democrat in this state should be campaigning on um, hard um, to basically to move forward, a step forward towards uh, um, tuition-free college and universities in this state. So big deal this week, Sean. Yeah, uh, something we got to push for and not just push for in election years. Yeah, exactly. 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 <clears throat> so, Sean, why don't you take us out with uh, kind of uh, stuff on kind of a poor people's campaign this week and uh, also some uh, interesting uh, news about uh, DSA folks down in Philly, too. Well, the Bernie Kratz in Philly. Bernie Kratz in Philly. Same thing. Uh, so uh, the Democratic Party is getting a different shade. It's going to become a uh, different shade of red, I guess, you yeah. know. A bunch of DSA members were up in the Capitol this weekend uh, or this past Monday with the Poor People's Campaign uh, getting arrested for uh, a right to healthy environments and health care for all and healthy communities. Um, and, you know, they had signs, people over profit and planet over profit hanging from the back of the Capitol uh, where they got arrested at. And um, it's something where, I mean, I think it's it. it, it it shows you where the future of the Democratic Party is, mm -hmm. especially here in Pennsylvania. 
Um, you know, this ties in with, yes, the DSA have been doing having big wins in local levels. Uh, a Pittsburgh DSA member is looking to challenge um, the longtime city council president of Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, there people are just brushing it off like, who are, yeah, OK, whatever. These people aren't going to do anything. And then um, over the weekend, three Bernie Kratz. Or last week, three a uh, couple of Bernie Kratz, uh DSA members in Philadelphia won uh, ward seats that were once controlled by Johnny Doc and his machine. That's a huge deal. Yeah, these are ward politics. These are actually pretty uh, ward politics. Pretty much, uh, if you're a ward leader, you have a pretty strong say in who goes to Harrisburg or who goes to City Council. You have a seat at that table and making that decision. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, again, this, this shows you once again um, that the whole move to um, both from the our revolution folks, right? They're coming out of kind of, you know, what you call them Bernie Kratz in some way, that group with DSA. Um, they've made good on um, on their word, basically saying we are going to invest and we're going to build from, you know, local elections on the way up. Um, and here you go. A perfect example of this. I mean, like, who the hell pays attention to, like, ward like ward elections, right, in Philadelphia, right, except if those, you know, specific insiders for the longest time? Well, these folks are basically breaking that narrative up and saying, no, we are going to start paying attention to this stuff because we recognize that this is how the levers of the machine work. And so we're going to take over the levers, right, so that we can begin to change the way that the politics work in this state. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. So that's just something to keep an eye on and uh, see it develop from there. Yeah, absolutely. And kudos to DSA for coming up and joining like so overtly the Poor People's Campaign um, and basically not doing what so many left organizations have, have done in the past, which is like come out and basically had to do their own thing as opposed to this. Nope, we're going to lend it. We're all in this together as part of a big movement. DSA showing up with the Poor People's Campaign um, and again have been helping to organize some of the stuff in the Poor People's Campaign there. So go DSA. Man, anything else for the kind of good of the order on this one, Sean? No, that's it. All right. Well, we will go into our break. And remember, everybody, um, become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Go to patreon.com slash RC Press. Um, we need you today, right? And again, I'll give the shout out to Connor once again for joining us this um, last this past week uh, at the ten dollar a month level. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, and it, to make sustainable pull no punches movement media make that possible, we need you. We need the progressive community to step up. Um, give us five bucks a month. Um, become a member for those five bucks a month. Go to patreon.com slash RC Press. We'll be right back after this with the last call. <laughs> This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Over the past six years, we've brought unapologetic, progressive, activist media to Pennsylvania and beyond. We've helped hold those in power accountable and shine a light on some amazing activist work. We've broken national stories and established a reputation as an aggressive, independent media site. As newsrooms close and traditional journalists lose their jobs, hard-hitting, investigative news suffers. If we care about our democracy, we have to find new, sustainable models of journalism. And frankly, no one's going to do it for us. After the Trump election, we dug in even deeper. Thanks to some longtime members, one-time donations, and a shift in other resources, we brought on more writers and started paying them. Now we're doubling down and want to expand our infrastructure and pay our writers even more. We need to invest in our media if we have a chance to resist the unprecedented assault on democracy, working families, women's rights, and our planet. History will remember the choices we make today. So take a minute to become a member of Raging Chicken Press. For as little as $5 a month, the price of a local craft beer or a cup of coffee, you will be supporting homegrown progressive journalists and media activists. Go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the Support and Membership tab to become a member. Leave a one-time donation or learn about other ways that you can help. We don't have billionaire backers. Keeping progressive, activist media going strong depends on you. Thank you for all your help and support. Keep up the fight. Space is a war fighting domain, just like the land. There it is, man. The Space Force, once again, as the Gregory brothers doing their uh, 
uh, homage to uh, good old Donald Trump's Space Force, which we're going to get into in a minute because it's becoming closer to a reality Space Force. But anyways, um, before I get into space news of this week, I want to um, – I've mentioned this at the top of the show – um, but we've got big news here at Raging Chicken. Um, I'm working on a collaborative podcast. Um, this will be a collaboration between me and Raging Chicken Press and Colleen Fitzgerald of A Home Stony Run. Um, Colleen, uh, for those of you who um, um, may have heard us talk about Colleen before, Colleen was uh, she was the office manager at uh, for Abscuff at uh, Kutztown University. Um, she is 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 hands down one of the most kind of brilliant people I know. Um, one amazing organizer, um, and and just I mean comes about uh, the ways of thinking about. Um, sustainable resistance in ways that uh, are just uh, astounding. She's also a cook, right? Uh, if you follow, if you ever see her, and I'll, I'm going to put links on this once we launch um, onto a page. Um, but she's she's a cook, and if you just follow some of the photos that she puts on Instagram, I swear to God, I mean, it, I, I cannot, like, look at her pictures of cooking on Instagram without my mouth watering. I mean, stuff that she puts together is unbelievable. Um, but the most important part about this is that she's, um, she's kind of, um, very much networked into the kind of sustainable agriculture, small family farm stuff, um, organic, um, kind of communities, um, around kind of the greater Kutztown area. And, um, so we've been, you know, she and I have just bat around issues now for years now. And, um, she's just, um, one of these people that, you know, when I have discussions with, we start with kind of this one thing and it kind of goes in such interesting places, right? Especially in the way that, you know, when she thinks about food and people and resources and organization, all this kind of stuff. And so we've been having this idea for a while, um, to have some sort of podcast, um, together, but how that would take shape, we're not sure. And kind of, again, it's always time conflicts. And, you know, she's got a kind of a, a growing uh, kind of she's working on catering stuff. And she has got working on a cookbook. I mean, all this kind of crazy cool stuff. Um, she works at the Kutztown Tap where she's actually be, becoming, um, a, what do you call it? Like she's basically an apprentice, a smoker um, um, apprentice, right? Um, looking about smoking barbecue stuff and all this stuff. Absolutely amazing. But so this podcast, right, which we're going to call Free Range, right? Um, Free Range podcast a collaboration between um, Kevin Mahoney, me as Raging yeah. Chicken Press, and Colleen Fitzgerald from A Home Stony Run. Um, so we're going to be talking about things like, you know, urban rural issues and divides between co communities. We're talking about women farmers, we're talking about food deserts, um, feeding America, food insecurity in Pennsylvania and America, farming as resistance and persistence, how you can support local farmers. Right. Um, we're going to look at small breweries and distilleries and how they push back against the frackers and because water is life. Right. Um, what's happening in so many areas. We're going to look at policy issues like the Farm Bill, international trade agreements. We're going to talk about the Pennsylvania Constitution and how that intersects with questions of food um, and growing and sustainability. We're going to look at things like Act 13, right? But then um, we're also going to have segments uh, each time um, we do a podcast. And I think that we're going to start out with, I, I think this is the model that we had. We're going to start out with um, once a month initially. Um, but I can see this going very quickly to um, once every other week, at least biweekly, if not weekly, um, depending on um, where things go. But so each time we do a podcast, um, Colleen's also going to um, focus on some a local farm or product or event highlight um, and looking at kind of, you know, you know, organic and natural ingredients. Um, she's worked at Creaky Tree Farm that she's going to be talking uh, about some of the work that she's been doing on these farms. Because, yeah, she's not someone who just kind of knows about the farms and goes in shops there. But the way that Colleen kind of engages with the world is very much, you know, OK, I'm going to learn this from the ground up. So she's gone and it's kind of basically apprentice at these farms, too, as well, learning about how they um, work with the land and kind of what the cycles and the labor issues are around um, kind of trying to do that kind of work. Um, so it's going to be I I think it's going to be a really cool project here. Um, Colleen is also going to be launching um, her Patreon page, right? So um, this is going to be a strong push um, for um, for um, people to join up with Colleen uh, on Patreon too as well. Um, I had hoped to have our full promo ready to go today. She and I talked for, God, it was like three hours the other day. And I had some great audio I was going to bring in. But um, with my new mixer coming in, it took me a little bit longer than I had expected to actually get all the sound stuff ready and to kind of solve some actually problems that, uh, from our previous mixer and kind of work all those issues out. But anyways, that's coming up. Free range um, collaboration between Raging Chicken Press and uh, a, home, a Home Stony Run with Colleen Fitzgerald. Um, that'll be coming soon, so look for it, folks. 
Um, so space news today. Um, the big news is uh, a few things. I, you heard a bunch of it in the intro today, but um, the, the things to drill down on Jim um, Bridenstein, right? Remember, we've talked about him. He was a Trump um, appointee to um, NASA, to head NASA. He's also the head of the history of climate denial, right? Um, and he is a privateer um, of all sorts, a guy who was also was brought up on charges, right, for kind of misusing funds, right, of a nonprofit organization as a way to um, kind of line his own projects. Um, so again, right, lockstep in, in uh, with uh, the Trump administration. Um, but what was more important, what I wanted to just kind of remind, not remind folks of, but bring bring this to everyone's attention, is that so in a very small, like what seemed to be a small move this past week, um, NASA basically announced that um, what it was going to do is was going to start to privatize um, or going to sell off the International Space Station, right? At least that's how it got reported in many um, in many venues. And um, from what Bridenstine basically said was that, like, look, we're going to need, and this is kind of from Space News, quote, NASA will need to partner with industry whenever possible to maximize its ability to carry out exploration and science goals while maintaining internal capabilities to build launch vehicles and spacecrafts, the new agency administrator said. Right? He had this hour-long roundtable, and he wants to, quote, maximize the utility of every dollar that we spend taking advantage of commercial uh, of commercial is the best way we can do this right and basically wanted to kind of start bringing in private companies to run things right now that was um initially reported like oh my god he's going to privatize or sell off the international space station that was some of the re- reports that i was hearing initially um but there was a clarification that came forward about what that actually meant um, from uh, Sam uh, Simami, Simami, uh, Simami, uh, I don't know how to say his last name, but he basically is the director of the International Space Station. And he's like, well, it's not exactly uh, like privatizing that. Um, and this is what he said. So um, this is, again, an interview he did with Space News um, with uh, what's the guy's name for Deborah Werner, uh, not the guy's name, sorry, woman's name um, for Space News. And she asked him to, there's a Washington Post article about NASA t- um, talking with commercial consortium about taking over ISS operations. What does this mean? And um, this was uh, Sam Shmimi's, um response. Quote, our intention is to be able to turn over the day-to-day operations of the ISS to private industry by the middle of the next decade. Within that, there could be partnerships between companies that actually operate the ISS based on a particular business plan that they all have. As far as NASA's direct plan, our plan is to turn over the day-to-day operations to private industry, to be able to operate modules in space, to be able to do all the planning, training, real-time operations, sustaining engineering, and, um, and NASA could be one of the many customers for low Earth orbit. Right. So basically a mall. Right. And when I read this, I'm thinking like this is exactly what happened with food service. Right. In higher education, instead of actually having food service right there, you basically shopped it out to Burger King and all these other people to uh, to take, take this over. So there's real movements being made in that direction. And again, this is the galactic capitalist um, making their moves right now, quietly outside of the realm of kind of the Twitter sphere and so on, especially people like Sean who could give a crap about this stuff. Um, but this is I actually really, our future. I really don't give a fuck, but I think it like the, 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 <laughs> the idea of having like a Burger King <laughs> on the International Space Station has piqued my interest. I'm thinking like, man. <laughs> God. Well, you know. Like, 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 imagine, like, how are they going to get the shitty fucking Cisco food up into the space station? I'm telling like, you. Well, it's going to be a. Are they, are they, are they just going to send off, like, in a freight? Like, a, um, they're just going to just going to put boosters to the back of a crate? Like, the, uh, <clears throat> like, just put boosters on the back of a, uh, of a truck? Um, of a truck crate, or whatever, and just I just shoot it up there. No, like, what they're gonna Cisco. do? Look, this is like this is this is like standard stuff. If you look at the rise of the trucking industry, it's the same deal. Except this is like at the billion dollar level. SpaceX has already established like its delivery system, right? Using kind of the Dragon capsule in order to kind of like make make deliveries, non manned um, deliveries to the space station of food and supplies. Right. Not only are we going to put like stuff in space, like fast food and all we're gonna colonize mars with fast food we're gonna do it with no labor that's right <clears throat> that's right right well no the labor is going to be all the people working in the freaking warehouses right they're gonna grow up around the kind of space agencies where they're gonna be shipping this stuff back and forth 
right? So not only are you kind of like, you've got your delivery systems for products and all that kind of stuff that, that's already being established as we see it, right? And again, I'm as much a nerd for watching those rockets go up as anybody else, as you know. Um, but that's really what's happening, right? We're I handing watch them that over. I watch them see if they go down. What's that? I watch them for the explosions. <laughs> yeah, I watch them for both, actually, you know? So I don't discriminate, <laughs> no, man. I, uh, <clears throat> like, it, it's, I remember seeing um, the Orson Welles' Time Machine movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more modern take on it, um, when I was like thir- when I was like a teenager, mm-hmm. and all I remember is like them fast forwarding to like twenty thirty nine, and they're starting like the big moon project. Yeah, like and this is like before the moon the moon breaks apart and like you know just co- becomes like dust in the orbit, but like they start this huge like yeah and they're just sending people up over up off into space. This is just what we're like talking that. about. Pretty soon the moon's gonna be broken up into like five different chunks and it's gonna be, you know, just rolling around the there yeah i actually i actually downloaded this i actually downloaded this game this week it's called uh terra genesis um because i was just interested about it and basically the whole premise of the game it's kind of like a sims type of game um where you're colonizing planets right or you're kind of like whatever I, I, colonization is the wrong word but I, i've got a whole other thing i could go on on that and i'm well, not going people to. there to kill so well yeah so it's basically it, it's like yeah <laughs> I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to subject you to this, John. But it's like basically it's col- it's like reverse. It's like you're basically importing the the regime and the power and governance structure of colonization to a space that doesn't have the people to remove. But you, you're going to keep the same logic in place. But that's uh, that's a Why short version. Why like a penal colony? What's that? They like just start opening up like penal colonies, dude. You don't think that's on its way? Oh, they probably will. You've been banished to the moon. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. Look, this is this is a trope in every si- like good science fiction piece about kind of like the penal colonies and the labor camps and all this kind of stuff. You can guarantee that is down the road. Look, we've already privatized like a huge chunks of our of our prison industry in this country. Right. We have the largest priv- um, prison population in the pl- on the planet. Right. And you're going to tell me that those folks don't see opportunities. This is going to be like the Australia model. Well, what do you do? Well, you're gonna, you send the crooks. Send Australia. <laughs> Don't forget the rabbits. Send the rabbits. <laughs> Make sure there's rabbits, too. <laughs> you know, like, like that. I'm telling you, they're going to use the, the freaking Australia model. And it's, Ain't no mail going back and forth that way. No, exactly. There was the U.S. Botany Bay, right? That, that was a, a, a Star Trek, the original Star Trek, right? You, you, know, you know, Khan, Wrath of Khan. Have you heard about Khan, at least? Please tell me you have. No, I have oh not. Oh, my God. <laughs> my God, what's going to happen to our world with a generation that doesn't know about Khan? But, uh, um, <clears throat> but uh, there's Khan! Um, if somebody out there will know what I'm talking about, whoever listens to this segment. But um, um, th- there was a, again, they used the same logic from what happened with Australia, where they basically took criminals and shipped them there. What had happened is that they, they um, the U.S. and, well, what, whatever governance structure was at the time, I don't know, started producing these kind of super soldiers. Right. And um, they were criminals and things like this. And these were producing these super soldiers doing all sorts of freaking weird genetic engineering to them. And um, they eventually got out of control. Right. And they basically committed a whole bunch of atrocities right? <laughs> because they were like actually people and they realized they couldn't just be controlled. So they started doing this when they started realizing that they were the superior beings. Right. So what they did. Um, in the show was they, they took them all these people that, that they created and they, and they took they put them on a ship, the USS Botany Bay. Right. And shipped them off to a planet. Right. That was the solution. Instead of killing them or jailing them or things like this, they shipped them off this planet to go live on their own. Well, it turns out the planet was basically inhospitable. Right. And a bunch of the people died and everything like this. So Khan comes back and he's the guy who's the wrath of Khan comes in to take his vengeance on, on Captain Kirk and the Enterprise, blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's the deal. And at the same look, it was playing out the same thing. You can see what's happening. Right. This is what I was talking about earlier on. You can see this kind of moving in that direction. So um, the second piece of this, right, is I've t- been talking about the privatization. I've been talking about the ways that this, the kind of galactic capitalists are going to make use of this stuff. The second piece of this now, though, is that very quietly there was a shift that was made um, just in terms of um, – uh, where is this? Where is – oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Did I lose it? Uh, I'm just going to have to talk you through it then. Um, basically, very quietly, what happened was um, these folks – in um well, let me see i gotta have this piece i know i just i just put it up here hold on one more second nope it's not gonna appear anyway so what happened is that you have the air force space command oh there it is okay you have the air force space command 
um, which is a real thing, right? It's not a fake thing. It's a real thing. Um, they have had um, had control over dealing with some of the kind of um, cyber security issues, right? I'm trying to prevent hacking on a bunch of stuff like this. Well, there's been a subtle shift to most people, most of us out here in the world. This doesn't mean anything, right? But you shift from the Air Force Space Command, um, the the idea about, you know, the responsibility for fighting hackers in cyberspace, and you're going to shift it to the Air Combat Command, right? All I got to say is, you know... Space Force. Space Force. It's a, once again, it's Space Force, right? They're shifting it to a combat mechanism. And, and, and what you see is that what they, uh, the, how they talked about this is say this realignment, this is from Space News again, quote, the realignment means that Air Force Space Command will be um, able to focus entirely on space superiority, said the command's leader, um, General J. Raymond, in a statement, quote, integrating cyber operations and intelligence and cyber capabilities under one command is a significant step toward enhancing our war fighting capabilities to conduct multi-domain operations, he said. Air Force Space Command will stay focused completely on gaining um, and maintaining space superiority and outpacing our adversaries in the space domain. So you see these kind of shifts being made where they're um, just like Trump said, kind of offhandedly about his Space Force stuff, is that this is a war fighting domain. I'm beginning to think about it in terms of superiority and kind of maintaining um, kind of like a uh, an attempt to go all out and, you know, make this a militarized space. Not a good thing. So uh, that's what's happened in space news this week, Sean. <laughs> you still with me? Yeah, Sean, yeah. Sean, you there? <laughs> no, a couple of people are just asking me for the uh, the letter, the Marcel Groen letter. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's like I Sean published the whole thing on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, um, so I've got I'll do my beer thing, and Sean's got some stuff, some news for us too as well. But um, want to remind. Still alive. Yeah, if you're still out there. Um, uh, for everybody out there, if you have beer tips, right? This is kind of, I think, a cool idea. Um, you got some beer tips that you think that we should give a shout out to here um, on the podcast um, in the last call segment. Uh, send us an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com and just use the subject line, last call tips. Love to hear about the beer that you're drinking, um, things that you think we should check out. Um, and, you know, give us a little description of what the experience is, send us pictures or whatever like this. We'll include it in the podcast notes. Um, that'd be freaking great. Um, but uh, locally here in Percocy, uh, Free Will Brewing, man, they, they went on a, like a like a canning bonanza um, this past week or so. So this week we have uh, several um, new releases. Um, one, there's Gorilla Grafting. That is a, and I'll give you their description because I haven't had any of these yet. I'm going later on today to pick them up. The uh, uh, Pastel IPA with rice, milk sugar, and lychee fruit. Lychee fruit, lychee fruit. I have no idea what that is, but that comes in at eight point cent, uh, eight point um, seven percent alcohol, and that is a collaboration with Levante Brewing. And then another Levante Brewing collab is out this week. It's called uh, um, um, DDH Cloudy Two, right? Or two with the kind of like you know factor of two kind of thing. DDH Cloudy Two. It's a double dry hop New England style a, um, IPA coming in at six point seven ABV, ABV, right? Um, then you've got yet another collaboration with Chatty Monks Brewing. Um, it's one it's called Race Against Time, and that is a Orange Cream Skull inspired IPA coming in at 7.2% ABV. Um, and uh, I'm still going to stick by some recommendations that I've given before. Uh, if you're coming down and you're going to check out Free Will, um, check out Judo Financing. Um, that is that New England style IPA with key limes. That is so good. And I've been like, we want to have been shopping to everyone. For me, this is not this is not usually in my wheelhouse of stuff that I absolutely love. But holy man, this is great. Um, definitely check out Duct Tape and Zip Ties. That's the House Pilsner, and it's coming in at a light 5.0 ABV. Um, great summer drinking beer, hot day drinking beer, a traditional kind of like House Pilsner that you would find like in any kind of local brew pub out in Germany. I mean, this stuff is so good. Um, do check out Duct Tape and Zip Ties too as well. Um, but yeah, so that's my beer tips for the week. Um, so Sean, you don't have so much beer tips as much as kind of like, you know, your, uh, kind of emerging, um, like what second or third side career going on here, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so, um, I wouldn't say emerging yet. I'm getting there. Uh, I'll say emerging. But, <laughs> your stuff is great. Um, 
yeah, last week I got my first prints in the mail. Um, the first I, I printed a photo last year. I didn't really like it. You know, I kind of did it like spare the moment, but I am taking that um, step towards printing my stuff. And one of the things I printed, I did a black and white photo of the uh, Walnut Street walking bridge out here in Harrisburg. It's an old steel trestle bridge uh, going across the river. Um, the other side of it is uh, is knocked out. It, it was knocked out in, during in the middle of an ice jam. Um, this bridge is like pretty much like the like a Harrisburg cancer. Like pretty much, this is a landmark of Harrisburg. Yeah. Pretty, one of these one of these landmarks in the city that if it was if, if a disaster was to happen to it, they would have to rebuild it right away just because of like uh, how much the bridge means to the city. Uh, it's a walking bridge. Um, this it really serves people walking from uh, City Island who park their cars at reduced rates, uh, ten dollars a day, or like fifty dollars a month. Um, and who choose to walk into Center City. Uh, it's a quarter mile across the bridge, so it's it's a pretty hefty walk in the wintertime. Um, during, uh, we had our snowstorm in March, got a nice picture of it, went out there before it was pretty much untouched. Yeah. And got a picture of the uh, bridge in the snow, uh, shot it to a point where I bumped my ISO up a couple of stops, um, which means it's more sensitive to light, so it means we could have a faster shutter speed. And so with that faster shutter speed, uh, I was able to like pretty much like freeze frame the snow falling to the ground. It's beautiful. W- without compromising the uh, quality of the, the image uh, with the ISO being up. And yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's one of my favorite photos. Um, I, got, I ordered eight of them. I did, did my first two. They came out good. I just don't want to sell them uh, because I scratched the photo up a little bit when trying to get on the thing. Or I just didn't have the cut down properly, but yeah, no, I have. Um, I'm going to start try to start selling prints within the next month or so. Uh, focus on things locally, and yeah, uh, no, this is one of my favorite photos I've taken like, like, since I bought the camera, probably. It's it's beautiful. I mean, I love and, it. And what I did was I got it printed on metallic paper. Yeah. Which gives it like more of a metallic sheen to it, which is awesome. It's a nice and black and white photo uh, with the snow falling. Um, and then I took a nice, another picture I've been working on all week, uh, earlier in the week, which is pretty cool. Yeah. The other one, I mean, man, Sean, I'm telling you, every single picture that you put up is like better than the last one now. Um, but the, the, this is the bench one you're talking about, right? Yes. The park bench. Yeah. Um, this is a, you know, I was out scouting a photo. This is Um, like an homage of Mark Price, right? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) <laughs> down by the river, folks. Down by the river. <laughs> if anyone knows Mark Price on Twitter, uh, he's always making jokes about living in a van down by the river. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I put up online, a bunch of people, my f- bunch of people who f- follow each other within me, that our echo chamber, uh, picked up on the subtweet real quickly. <laughs> um, it was all in jest, though. Uh, the picture I took, um, park bench, the way like the. Like the way the way I was like looking, I was actually out scouting for this photo the day before, just riding my bike around the riverfront. Like, oh, what would be a good place to set up a tripod and just stand there for a bit? So I saw this park bench there. Um, there's nothing else distracting in the image. Like, there's no trees in the way. There's no lamp posts like that's boning the image. It's just really fucking over the image and it's distraction. Mm-hmm. So like, it's the park bench and the way it's set up. Like, you can see like the hill uh, it sits on. So it meets. It makes like a nice triangle going down to where uh, the, the Cumberland Valley Railroad Bridge is at. That's actually an abandoned bridge um, that's been, it's just grass and all has been growing in it. Um, not recommended travel on that bridge because mm-hmm. uh, I was actually thinking about doing it. People said, you better watch out uh, just because a lot of the vagrants in the area come by and use that bridge. So it's not particularly a safe place to, uh, mm-hmm. to take pictures by yourself. Um, but I got that bridge and then it was able to like the way, like the, the river walk, and the hill sets up, you have like a triangle in the lower frame, and then the way the river is and the color, you have a triangle on the upper frame. And it has, it's just a really nice, well-composed shot. Yeah, well, I mean, I loved, and that, what I loved about that shot in particular was like, you know, you've got that, you've got that, that bench in such kind of clear focus, right? Um, and then as you just see the kind of, uh, you know, the river and the landscape and the bridge kind of, you know, because the bridge is, is you know, a fair amount away. It's not like right there. Right. But you see that off there and you've got the sunset kind of coming through the bridge there. Um, and there's just, just the lighting and the, uh, the composition is gorgeous. Yeah. And I'm not done working up on the picture. I've been uh, focusing like a lot of time taking the goose shit <laughs> <laughs> out of the bridge. Uh-huh. I mean, just like 
it's something that if you make prints of it, they're like, oh, it's all this. Like you look closely. So I'm trying to take at least like seventy to like eighty percent of the goose shit out of the out, out of the picture. So. <laughs> Sort of looks natural, and there's not just piles of shit everywhere. <laughs> well, but wait, 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 wait. Sort of looks natural. The goose shit is the natural stuff, right? No, you make it look like a, look a cl- like a clean slate of uh, concrete going all the way down. Right. What 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 our infrastructure could look like in the future? <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. And one of the cool things, like one of the things I've been doing lately, uh, focusing on, is like when you're shooting photos, especially like, outside. There's no sense in like having your aperture set at four mm-hmm. if you're like. If you're a wide open zoom at like 18 or 24 millimeter, mm-hmm. because it's just like you're you're not getting that really strong of an image. I stopped the aperture all the way down to like 10 or 11, mm-hmm. and then I bracketed my exposure, which means I just did a simple HDR shot, so I get the perfect exposure. Uh, with my histogram. Do you and realize what you just said? You just said like I. I I I, blah, blah, I bracketed blah, 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 blah. I no no you said I bracketed my exposure which means I did an, did an HDR shot like that's like saying like I did a hyperbolic testing thing which basically means go, go, go quantum leap right? so we're basically like my I had, I had my shutter speed set set at one 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 twenty fifth of a second uh-huh. uh the one like that gets all, all the lights the shadows or the highlights and all was like one seventy fifth of a second and then the other ones at one three hundredth of a second you take those three photos you merge them together. And um, and Lightroom or in post processing, and what that does is it gives you a full depth of the photo, almost like a surreal look yeah. at it. Oh, that's so, interesting. I had no idea that you that you did that for that. That's really cool. Yeah, so it merges, and really, I didn't have. I mean, the photo it that does the post editing for you, pretty much, mm-hmm. like where all your levels should be. And with that, I added some things to it. I'm actually looking at doing this in black and white. That'd be but interesting yeah, like, to see. Yeah. But no, the color the color came out really well. It was gorgeous. I mean, the greens the greens were just were just lovely. I mean, really. Yeah, and I shifted my white balance down a bit to give more blue in the river, mm-hmm. like a more mm-hmm. natural blue look, instead of like a big bright orange look. Like everything was like blown out in orange with right, my original right. photo. So yeah, but no, I've, it's fun. Cool man. Uh, so follow Sean, man. Follow Sean on Instagram. Uh, you want to give Kitchen a shout out? Kitchen Snaps. Kitchen dot snaps right on Instagram um, and check out his um, check out his photos. Um, they're really amazing. And look for that time in the not so distant future where Sean is going to be uh, hawking his wares um, and his photos yeah. and stuff like that. It's well worth it. His stuff is awesome. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the bridge, he's holding up the bridge photo right now so I can see it. Um, but seriously. Um, and then what I'm going to I'll tell everybody out there now is that one of the things that I'll um, that when Sean gets to the point where he's kind of willing to sell some of the stuff what we're going to do a raging chicken, we're going to buy one of the prints from him and that's going to go off to a, a, a special donation um, like you know doesn't even have to be a membership it can be a one-time donation um, um, we'll give you a couple options there um, and that'll be one of our giveaways because uh, he's uh, his stuff is great right and um, kudos to you man thank you <laughs> all right uh, anything else for the good of the order Sean um, no that's it no that is it all right, so this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I want to remind everybody, uh, become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as 5 bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress, and you can become a member today. Right? If you really just you don't want to become a member, you just rather give us money, that's fine too as well. You can just go to ragingchickenpress.org, and there's a new big, big blue donate button on the right sidebar. You click donate there, and um, you donate any amount that you want. Um, just enough to say, hey, uh, I like what you're doing. We support your work but really the heart of what we do the heart of building a sustainable model for progressive media in the state of pennsylvania homegrown progressive media is for you to become a member go to patreon.com slash rc press um and you're on your way all right so this is kevin mahoney editor and founder of raging chicken press it's been another crazy and awesome week in so many different ways talk to you soon everybody see ya This race is about people versus money. We've got people, they've got money. It's time we acknowledge that not all Democrats are the same. That a Democrat who takes corporate money, profits off foreclosure, doesn't live here, doesn't send his kids to our schools, doesn't drink our water or breathe our air, cannot possibly represent us. (laughs) 